as he began his ministry, you know, he would have the poor would, would have the good news preached to them and uh, to set the captives free and to break the fetters and the yokes. And he's not talking about literally setting captives free, like, you know, hostages or something, mm-hmm. but, but those who are enslaved to sin and addiction. Welcome to episode one of season two of Breaking Bread Catholic in Ireland. Today we have Father Joseph Mary Dean from Limerick Grey Friars. You're very welcome, Father Joseph Mary. Thank you for coming. I am here without my wife. I feel her absence greatly. <laughs> She's on a personal retreat in Craig Lodge in Scotland, and uh, we pray for her that she has a really good time and the Lord comes close to her, as or she senses his closeness. He will be close. Well, thank you, Tony. It's great to be here with you. Thank you so much. Can I ask you a, a preamble question? Do you pray <laughs> with your hood up or hood down? Um, yeah, well, it's actually one of the reasons why uh, the hood is there is... Um, for practical reasons, you know, if it's raining or cold, but also the friars and monks would often use it in the chapel, um, partly to keep out the cold, but also partly um, when you put it up, it kind of blocks out some of the sounds and some of the sights. So it kind of puts you into a little prayer cave so you can kind of be distracted. So the, the distractions are less because you can't see what people are doing over there and the noises are blocked out somewhat. So it's, yeah, it's like your own little personal prayer cave. That's good. That's good. I pray. So we do both. Yeah, yeah, I pray with the dressing gown. It's not the same as what you've got, but I, I, I sometimes pray with the hood up, and I, I actually find it really helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel it helps my prayer. There's a long tradition of either hoods or shawls. You know, like yeah. the Jews have the prayer shawls, and so yeah. Amen. <laughs> and yours is you get one or two for life, and you patch them up. Uh, well, more. Uh, you patch them up, and then eventually. It's uh, <laughs> you wear it out. <laughs> yeah, you wear it out, and you have to move on to something new. Eventually, it's more patched than than <laughs> original, and it's time to retire it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're a, a what? What I would understand to be a gray friar. Can you give us your <coughs> official order name, please? Yes, yeah, the the CFRs, which stands for Community of the Franciscans of the Renewal. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and started in New York. Yep. Father Benedict Rochelle was one of the founders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was the primary founder with seven other Capuchins. Yeah, founded in 1987 in uh, New York City. Mm-hmm. As in, they're all Capuchins, so it's we follow the Capuchin spirituality. So we're not officially a branch of the Capuchins, but we would be like an offshoot and consider ourselves Capuchin in spirituality. Beautiful, beautiful. And yeah, I must say, whenever I was, you know, Mike, who's on the desk, Sage. Uh, Father Benedict Ro- Rochelle and Mother Angelica were two l- shining lights that mm. you know that led the church with clarity and spoke with clarity at a time when there was a lot of confusion about different things. And you know they were very very compassionate, mm-hmm. but they were also very very clear. And I found it personally as a Catholic really helpful mm. uh, in in certainly guiding me. And you know you were attracting lots of vocations. I know you still are attracting vocations because some of our guys who have you know been missionaries are, have joined you. Mm-hmm. What tell us about that? Um, oh, well, the aspect of uh, the attractive vocations and yeah, yeah. No, it's still um, it's still something um, that men are attracted to. I think early on, perhaps there was um, a great influx. Partly because we might we were kind of the only game in town. Yeah. Um, most a lot of religious orders had kind of drifted from their authentic expression, and so as far as orders that were, you know, living a dynamic orthodoxy, um, of you know a rigorous prayer life, um, love for Our Lady, the Eucharist, faithful sons of the Church, and the Magisterium. There wasn't a lot of options. Now there are a lot of more options. I think a lot of religious orders have seemed to have turned the corner and realized um, some tried to do some experiments as our, our moral theology professor um, at Dunwoody would say during the silly season of the church. Uh, they kind of went all different directions and let's try this, let's try this. But a lot realized, no, let's just be... Faithfully Catholic. And uh, so I think there's a lot more options now. But it's still we're still attracting men. And it's a very particular charism. And we don't, um, we're not like big recruiters because we're not trying to convince people to join. It's really just to help men discern if there's a movement of the heart, if this is a right fit for them. Mm-hmm. And so often, you know, as not, we'll say, no, we don't really think this is the right fit. There might be an attraction to the community. 
but as far as what they're actually looking for, um, it's, no, this might not be for you, but we will, you know, usually direct them. You might want to look more into this if they want to run a parish or if they want to be a full-time teacher or if they want to, you know, there's different things. Um, if they want more of a strictly contemplative life, ours, cause ours is active and contemplative. And so, yeah, there's, um, there's been many who've inquired and we've said, no, um, we're not just taking, mm-hmm. you know, good men, but really trying to help men discern, yeah. um, is this, is this the right thing for you? And, uh, you know, oftentimes there's a lack of brotherhood in our lives as lay people. And if, if, if a man is a single man, just hanging out with a bunch of dudes <laughs> <laughs> it is an attractive option, you know, yeah, yeah. and, and it's uh, like to, to have that community, to have men who are, you know, striving for and achieving holiness and, and, and in their lives, uh, you know, all that sounds really attractive. Who wouldn't want to have that, mm. you know, but also you give up a lot too. Yeah, no, for sure. But that was one of the, I think, initial thing that probably attracted a lot of us, if not all of us, to the community was in a great part the fraternity. There was a real yeah. brotherhood there, a real fraternity. Um, yeah, and all the stuff mentioned, a, a joyfulness, a, a faithfulness to the church, a love of Our Lady, a love of the Eucharist, um, a love of the hands-on work with the poor and evangelization. And so... But yeah, a big part was seeing the brothers interact and to seeing that joy and uh, the fraternal love was, yeah, it was, very, it, was the, it was the first thing that struck me mm-hmm. was to mm-hmm. seeing how the brothers lived and interacted together. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the silly season, there was a lot of, uh, you know, you, you talk about it in its affirmative, I, I'll say it in its negative, and the reason you guys were shining light was because you weren't having any part of the, mm. the negative and the negative was let's experiment with sexuality. Let's, let's say that it's okay to be, you know, to act on same sex attraction, that, that type of thing. And, you know, at a time when those ideas were being introduced and, and actually acted, acted upon people like mother Angelica and father Benedict Rochelle were able to speak into that with authority as well, you know, and, and also, you know, something I learned from that and I brought it into my ministry whenever I went full time in ministry is that, evangelization is not orthodoxy, but without orthodoxy, we can't have evangelization because what are we evangelizing to? Mm. And it, it's very easy to see in the fruit, you know, faithful orders are fruitful. Mm-hmm. Orders that are not faithful are not fruitful. It's really simple. It's black and white and it's biblical. And, you know, it's straight from the mouth of Jesus. So, you know, it wouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the the idea of orthodoxy and evangelization. And another way that I would often r- phrase that is the truth with love. So it has to be the fullness of the truth. You can never water it down. Mm-hmm. But it has to be coming from this place of radical love and radical love for the individual. And so that's when, and like, I was actually just talking about that today with somebody. So often what's missed in the discussions of things with same-sex attraction is there yes that we would all agree on that nobody should be persecuted nobody should experience you know discrimination or you know or hatred or any kind of violence or any, anything like that just because of their their attraction mm-hmm. um and so that's absolutely true but the world is really shifted into this gear of really promoting it and almost forcing it and it where it's made it like we'll just do it because now it's the cool thing to do and so many young people are confused but what's missed in all that is the love which is for people who are struggling with that or maybe they don't even feel like they're struggling who have that um where's the love for them in helping to say okay what's what's wounded in your heart um that maybe needs healing um, because everything that everything of who we are, so often, so much of who we are, comes from our place of woundedness, and inst- instead of just kind of forcing the whole agenda, instead of saying, okay, but what kind of love can we reach out to people with to help them experience any kind of healing? Because so often you can trace back um, the things that the feelings that people are having to a woundedness, uh, to a hurt that's happened. And so to really go into that place, because we don't, you know, whenever I'm speaking with people, so often people will come to me and say, well, you know, I just, you know, hello, my name's so-and-so, I just want you to know that I'm gay. I'm like, 
okay, well, f- first thing I'd like to say is that's not your identity. That's mm-hmm. that's you're speaking of the attraction that you have, and that's and that happens, and having that attraction is not a sin. Mm-hmm. Um, but your identity, first and foremost, is a son of God or a daughter of God. So let's just start from that place. Your identity is a child of God, and for you to know that first and foremost, and that you're loved by Him, and so really just going into. Uh, I think, you know, the place of love. Um, and so it's speaking of against the, the lies of the world where it's forcing uh, this issue in so many ways and it's just unraveling in so many absurd ways now um, with so much confusion and really coming back to the place of loving the individual mm-hmm. um, and, and where they're at and helping them to experience God's <laughs> love and an encounter with him. Absolutely. And, you know, we need to make a distinction between the love and compassion for the individual and the ideology which promotes that as mm-hmm. a lifestyle mm-hmm. that, you know, we, we, we can deal with them both separately. Less mm-hmm. compassion for the ideology, more compassion, uh, total compassion for the individual. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, as an American being in Ireland, what do you think of Trump's victory in the election? <laughs> like, li- literally, just go for it. Don't don't hold back here. I want to yeah. hear what you, I mean, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican by yeah. in background? It would be first. Republican by background because okay. they're the only party that's promoting life and is more in line with church teachings, whereas so much of, on some of the social justice issues, the Democrats might um, have a leaning with some of their, uh, some of the things with the poor or or immigrants, but even then there's a bit of confusion with how they go about it. Mm -hmm. Um, But the the biggest issue is life. Um, Just the sanctity of the the unborn child uh, of that life. And the Republican Party was the only one that's standing up for them in any way, shape, or form. And also just even not not even just that, but you know, the number of issues that would be against church teaching that the Democratic Party espouses that for me as a as a faithful Catholic, I, I couldn't ever espouse myself to that party. Did you um, vote? I did. Okay, good on you. Po- postal vote. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mail and, and ballot. And what what do you like what is your sense of President Trump? Like how do you feel about him being elected? And l- like really yeah. do, like we don't we shouldn't have be afraid about what yeah, what no. is it we think we're in Ireland. No, no. It's far away. Yeah, no. Yeah. I mean in some ways they they neither one of them were um you know, sometimes when you're looking and saying is this out of a country of 300 something million, um, are these the only two options? But um, and I think the biggest problems that people have with Trump is really personality issues. But I don't vote on personality issues. It's not a popularity contest. Policy wise, uh, if you look at his first uh, presidency, his policies were good. Uh, you know, economically, fiscally, he got in pro life Supreme, Supreme Court justices. Um, you know, everything, the, the, you know, the, there was the highest rise in uh, middle class amongst Latinos and African-Americans. The uh, unemployment rate was down. He was bringing businesses and factories back into America. He was finally making other countries, you know, pay tariffs so we weren't just losing out on all the international trade. So, he, and he was also going after a lot of the corruption and that's there. Um, Draining the swamp, as yeah, he called it. Yeah, and even this uh, Elon Musk was talking about, you know, guys with his own, you know, when, when he uh, took over, you know, uh, Twitter, it was um, the, 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 how many redundancy, how much redundancy there was and in the company and just let go of tons of people because a lot of people are getting paid a lot of money not to do anything. And he wants to look at that with the government. And I'm like, I'm delighted. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, because there is so much bureaucracy and red tape, how can we streamline this and make it better for the people? And I think, they're the only ones that are actually talking that way. So, yeah. So I voted for him, and uh, gosh, you've really nailed your colors to the flag there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you voted for Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it was funny because a lot of people were like, "Oh, I can't believe all these fans." You know, for him, I'm like, it's not everybody's fans, but a lot of people are like saying a definite no to the other option and the direction that was going. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the votes were more of like, "We definitely don't want that." So this is the other option that we have. So therefore, we'll go that way. Um, but again, yeah, his personality, <laughs> you know, I think everybody wishes that he wouldn't <laughs> say the things that he says. Um, he makes himself an easy target um, for criticism. 
but even then, I think you know the the what's with him is he just doesn't care. Um, because I think he, he knows no matter what he says, he's going to be torn to pieces. From the day he was elected, before he did anything, he was already torn to pieces. Um, and everything he said was analyzed and scrutinized. So I think he maybe just got to the point of like saying, I just don't care. I'll just go, no matter what I say, it's going to be. Yeah, you know, so. It's, it's so interesting. I watched the speech that Obama gave mm-hmm. recently, and he was campaigning for, Hil- not Hillary, but uh, oh. Kamala. And he was so eloquent, so polished. He has a gift Mm -hmm. for public speaking. He comes across as a really credible politician, a credible person. And I just want him to be somebody I could vote for if Mm -hmm. I was living in America, Mm -hmm. just because he's such a good representative of the country. Mm -hmm. And then I look at Donald Trump and I think, gosh, like you, this is, this is, uh, he's an interesting character. He's very bombastic. Um, he has definite, obvious character flaws. Um, that are there for everybody to see, but really should he be deplatformed from, from Twitter whenever the head of the Taliban is still on Twitter, you know, what does that say about democracy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. And then I look at his ability to communicate and go on a podcast like this mm-hmm. with, you know, Theo Vaughn, Joe Rogan, sit there for three hours and talk about policy issues, talk about life, talk mm-hmm. about, stuff talk about his kids who he's really delighted to talk about and you know then jd vance is the same Mm -hmm. ability to go on and have a conversation be be really picked apart for a long period of time i mean you can't hide in a three-hour interview yeah and kamala was going to come on but she had preconditions areas that she didn't want to talk about and it was only going to be a 45 minute interview and he joe rogan had to go to her so she didn't really want to and she you know from my reading of the situation it appears to me that this is the culmination of the dei movement you know the diversity equity and inclusion movement whereby we promote people on the basis of their ethnicity their sexuality you know their gender etc cetera, etc cetera. and she, that's the, that's the end result of it. it the democratic party ended up with a candidate who was not fit to run for presidency in fact she wasn't even through the primaries, you know, so she wasn't selected by the by the the party to to go forward. It was just she was the only one there that was willing to run in the absence of Joe Biden being being fit to run. And uh, I feel sorry for Joe Biden. I actually don't think he's as bad personally as his policies would indicate. Um, I I actually think he's a likable person, but his policies were horrendous. You mm, know, partial yeah. birth abortion number one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how can any Catholic promote that? Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, Trump got in the Supreme Court justices that overturned Roe versus Wade, mm. you know, he did what he said he was going to do. And, and, you know, even just, he is the only sitting president that's ever personally showed up and addressed the pro-life rally in DC. Mm-hmm. Other ones would send in a comment or he showed up. Yeah. You know, so he's, he put his money where his mouth was, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. he showed up. Um, and so, yeah. Um, do I think he's got everything right? No, but, um, again, those were the options we had. Have, have you heard of the, the Hermit of Loretto? No. You haven't heard the story? No. Somebody, I'd heard it before a couple of times and somebody told it to me recently again. And there's this guy who was on wall street. This is actually, you, you can look it up online. Uh, he was a, big hedge fund manager on Wall Street, doing really well. He had a massive conversion to, to Christ in the Catholic Church, and he, f- he felt the need to go as a hermit. You know, he discerned it and whatever, uh, and the place he was he went to was was Loretto in Italy, where the house of Our Lady was miraculously moved by, by angels to, to Loretto. And he got it in prayer in the 1980s when Donald Trump was the biggest playboy ever that Donald Trump would be a future president and that he his his job as a hermit was to pray for Donald Trump. Mm. And this is the most ridiculous thing ever because this guy, you know, <laughs> yeah. Do, Donald Trump may appear ridiculous now, but and he's not, I don't think he is ridiculous at all. I actually think he's he's he actually talks a lot of sense if we choose to listen to him and put away the headlines and put away what it is our biased media actually portray him as. And it's not to say that there aren't character flaws there and there aren't things he you know he says that he shouldn't say, but it's nowhere near as bad. He's actually, he talks a lot of sense, a common sense, actually. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he prayed for Donald Trump, Jubilee year in, in, in Rome. And the, you know, the way the doors are taken down and, and whatever. So 
and then they're blocked up mm -hmm. for, for the next Jubilee. So this hermit bought a brick and put Donald Trump's name on it way back in the 1980s. And the Vatican have been praying, all the masses have been saying, been praying for Donald Trump and all everybody else who bought a brick and their intentions. But the Vatican have been praying for Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, and this 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 guy, so it's, it, it, you can check it out online. A Protestant pastor also got in prayer that this guy would be, Donald Trump would be would be a future president. But again, back at a time whenever it was the most ridiculous thing ever. <laughs> now, I watched a little bit of that online. I, I found it quite abrasive and I didn't, I didn't, find it, you know, okay, it's credible because this guy's predicting Donald Trump to be president, even though this is absolutely ridiculous whenever he was predicting it. And I find it, if this is true, and we don't know for sure that this is true, but it's credible if somebody says that I got it in prayer whenever the most incredible person to be a future president is predicted to be president 40 years prior to him actually becoming president. But if God is using this man, I find it really reassuring that he's using somebody with obvious character flaws like Donald Trump mm. and somebody with great leadership ability. Clearly, you don't get to be president of the United States, but also somebody who's three times married, you know, who's go he's really good to his kids. You know, I don't know if you hear him talking about his kids. Mm -hmm. I just like his kids are successful and are they're not perfect, but his kids are successful because their dad and the way he talks about them, and just just watch watch that dynamic. Um, I, you, do you get to watch much TV? Uh, not much, you know. Yeah. Time. Well, I, I I've been watching a bit of, of Donald Trump. I've been watching how he talks about his kids, particularly because in contrast to other politicians in America mm -hmm. whose kids haven't turned out so well. For example, I'm not going to mention. You know, there's no need to do that. But yeah, Donald Trump's kids have done very well for themselves. Mm -hmm. They've been respectful, decent citizens. You know, they've been upstanding. I've listened to them being interviewed, and they they talk sense. They're credible. Um, that doesn't happen by accident, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. No, he's um, yeah, definitely got um, you know, amazing love for them, and they and and it seems reciprocal. Yeah, so it he's seems doing reciprocal. Yeah, and he's um, yeah, he's doing a good job with them, and uh, and and many different, and like a lot of people that you hear, that say once you talk to him personally, and even some of the the world leaders that said he was actually great to work with, you know. Wow. Um. And so yeah, yeah, he was, a, but he was first uh, president ever who wasn't either a military man or a politician, um, but a businessman, you know, and uh, and that's what that's what a lot of Americans also focused on too was the state of the economy, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe it's better to have a businessman in there than a politician, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> trying to turn things around, and so yeah, um, they're very interesting, but I think definitely, um, you know, and being able to take as much. You know, he knew coming back into, uh, you know, running for the president again that he would be taking all sorts of heat again, you know. Um, Who needs that hassle? Yeah, exactly. He's already, he, he could just be like enjoying my life as, you know, multi, multi-millionaire, you know, with my beautiful wife and just living the high life. Yeah. Right? But he he's not because, and I and I do believe that he really loves America and he wants to make it a better place and fix some of the stuff that's broken and that's that's admirable so um you do know you, do you believe god saved him uh well i mean yeah whether it was active or passive well <laughs> he definitely said he did save him um uh yeah i mean it's he said that during his uh you know acceptance speech you know that many people said um you know that god saved me for a reason and mm -hmm. there's a history of that and uh so yeah he's definitely saved mm -hmm. and um you know, and I think hopefully it's for, it's, you know, you don't want to, because you never know how somebody's going to turn out. So you don't want to put too many eggs in the basket, you know, uh, of saying, oh, yeah, you know. But, um, again, I think it was a very important um, victory uh, for the nation because we definitely knew the direction that the other party was going to take us, and it was not of God. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, I don't know, um, you know, um where exactly he's going to, but, um, but I, th I felt like there was better hope there. Yeah, ba uh, ba based on their policy policies, I think we would both say that we would both align 
more closely with Donald Trump than I mean, there's Kamala Harris is not an option really. Yeah, no, in, in terms of you know partial birth abortion, you know what what they were doing to kids, you know yeah. even Im- immigrants who were paying for sex changes for any immigrant mm-hmm. who was illegally there but wanted to change gender. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and and uh, myself and Sheena lived in in Texas way back in the day, back in the the nineties, and we you know we have an affinity for America because of that love of America. I think Americans are great people. I think the American nation is a, a is a tremendous nation, and you really are the leaders of the free world. Mm. And what you do and how you go about what you do affects the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And something that really impressed me by American politics was that you are very. Your politicians are very able to talk about God, talk about their faith. Even Obama, I think, might have mentioned God at a time. I, I'm not sure about that, but I, I, I think he did. And it's it's like, it's just part of your culture. Mm-hmm. Now, Kamala wasn't sp- intentionally mentioning God. I'm sure that was intentional if she thought she would get votes from that. Maybe, I, I don't know. I, I can't guess what w- her motivation was. But whenever um, somebody said Jesus is Lord in a, in a rally, she said, oh, you're at the wrong rally. And it was very clear. Um, that you know, she was making a, a statement about you know mm-hmm. the Democratic Party isn't the party of God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, exactly. Yeah. Whereas we don't have that option here. Mm. You know, it's it, and I don't know what why that is. I think we're getting another option in the into party. I think mm-hmm. you know, no party is perfect, but they're definitely pro life, and it's it's uh, something that that you know it is a problem. You know, we've are we you know. America's bipolar. We're unipolar here, you know, mm. with a with an option of of into, and uh, you know we have election. Has the election date been announced yet? I mean the uh, for in Ireland. Oh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. When 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 that is, but uh, yeah, no. And that's the um, yeah, um, it's yeah. You you work. I think it was, and that's the thing I, I say about. People ask me about America. I say it's 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 a great it's a place of great light and great darkness. Great darkness, yeah. It's very light, you know, black and white. You know, it's very. Um, it's not a lot of, you know, it's it's not as much gray area. People, they're very, as you said, polarized, very uh, strong and. Praise God, you know, the majority of Americans st- still to this day would have a basic sense of faith and God and morals. And, and that's what I think why, I think that's what the Democratic Party didn't tap into at all. The average Joe still is a basic good guy, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. believes in God and wants, you know, what's right and family values and morals. And, and so it's, it's, you know, it's it's a great burden and a great blessing too, because you know anything that America does does influence the world, and it can influence it for for bad, mm-hmm. and it has in many ways, and it can also influence it for good, and it has in many ways, mm-hmm. and so uh, that's the that it's it's been placed in a privileged p- position, but you know, uh, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. Right, absolutely. Or as, or as uh, to quote the Lord, or to quote Spider Man, <laughs> with great, <laughs> great responsibility comes great power, comes great responsibility. Uh, so you know, yeah. time, uh, you know, and so, um, and so, yeah. I hope they take that. They they need to really be mindful of that. Yeah, I I I think how that filters down into the culture in America is that you guys, as a culture, are better, more equipped, able to talk about what you think, mm. what you talk about, what's good and bad. And why it's good and bad, mm-hmm. like you're okay in the space of, uh, I don't want to say philosophy, but just talking about what's going on in here, mm-hmm. you know what, <clears throat> and and you know if you believe in God or not, and it's okay to have that conversation. Whereas it's taboo here in Ireland. It might be okay with you because you're dressed the way you are. Mm-hmm. Whereas for me, as a what appears to be an ordinary lay person it's not okay for me to bring that up in conversation or so I'm told that it's not okay mm. for me to bring that up in conversation. I bring it up all the time. I don't care, <laughs> you know, but it, it's uh it's, it might make some people feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I do you speak to that. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. And I think that's the good aspect again, you know, that's the, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the good and the bad of everything. The good aspect of that. Yeah, there is, I do. I did notice that when I got here was, uh, 
Americans are much more inclined to just tell you how they feel, tell you what's going on. Um, you know, their beliefs, their, it's, it's all out there. They're, and often their hearts are on their sleeves, um, even to go in into things that they feel deeply about and to go into things with faith and um, who they are and what they believe. And so there's a beauty in that and that freedom. Um, now, sometimes, you know, and, and this is what I think annoys some Europeans, <laughs> is some often Americans will also just rabbit on incessantly <laughs> about whatever, like, and to the point where people are like, okay, shut up, you know? Um, and or sometimes they'll just, they'll spout it off with um, certain arrogance or a complaining spirit or, and they can be very loud and vociferous in, in a really annoying and negative ways too. And I, you know, I even noticed that now li living over here for so long and, you know, where I, I'll hear Americans talking sometime and I'm like, that's why people over here are annoyed with us. <laughs> you know, yeah. like just tone it down. Nobody needs it. Like they're just so vocal. So there's a good aspect and a bad aspect, you know, and so there's not a right or wrong. Um, sometimes it'd be better to pull it in a little bit. Um, but there is a freedom there. That's for sure that we, you know, it's where people aren't ashamed to just say how they feel and what they believe. And it's, and so that's the good aspect yeah. of it, yeah. And, and I see that, and I see all the, you know, I see all the negatives, but I also see the, what well, it comes out as a simplicity. Okay, so Americans are able to cut through the bull mm. and actually say what they actually think. Mm. And, you know, we're like, oh, it can't be that simple. You know, you're, you're just stupid. You know, you're, you're Bubba, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, like, what a, what a redneck, you know? And, and uh, it, it's, whereas it actually is that simple. If you've cut through all the nonsense that's there, that, you know, all mm -hmm. the nuances and, you know, sometimes things aren't black and white, mm -hmm. but sometimes things are black and white, mm -hmm. you know? And, and we overly nuance it in the guise of being sophisticated mm -hmm. or not wanting to go there in conversation, being afraid of the conversation. Yeah. And I, I think that Americans are great hosts, but poor ambassadors having lived there. Mm -hmm. And, and that's because they're you, you as a, you know, culturally are misunderstood outside of your own, your own culture. Mm -hmm. It's gray and it's raining. Yeah. What, what, why are you so freaking happy? Yeah, you know, yeah. and, th and this is uh, that positivity, which you bring to the, to the, wherever you go mm -hmm. is, you're po you're happy for a reason. Mm. Why would you say that is? You know, the Americans tend to be happier. Yeah, and I it's not just the weather. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit the weather, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's um, there is like a yeah certain. I did notice that too, um, because even like the humor, you know, here and like the the slagging culture and. Um, just cutting down and, and it's, it was, there's many things I had to learn a lot of lessons here. You know, there's, you know, people like, oh, the tallest flower gets cut, you know, keep your head down. Don't say anything, you know? And it's so contrary for me. I'm like, that's the only way you get ahead is to get noticed is to express yourself and, and talk about <laughs> that. And, and, and also like, um, the, uh, the, how uncomfortable people felt were like, were times where I was like frustrated or hurt or a little bit pissed off. And I started to express that, and you could the level of uncomfortability was complete like complete silence. Oh my gosh, it was like <laughs> like what is he on about? You know what's he doing? I'm like or just asking people the simple things like okay, you know what are you good at? You know we're trying to like work as a group. So what are, what are your gifts? Silence. You know it's like well I'll talk about you know some of the stuff that I feel like the gifts that God's given me and like the looks of like Jesus what you know what is he on about? Who's he think he is? You know going on and I'm like. No, I'm just, and I'm just, so there was many lessons I had to learn. I'm like, okay, it's very different, uh, massively different culturally. Um, and so, yeah, there is, um, but there is a general, the, you know, there has been at least traditionally a general, it's, and it's less and less so, and it's, and it's sad for me, but it was generally like where I grew up, it was generally just a positive place, you know? Yeah. It was, it was a general. An encouraging place. Encouraging, affirming, and initiatives were put into place for people to get ahead, and you wanted people to get ahead, and you wanted people to exceed, and you, to succeed in their different endeavors and you rejoiced in that. And, um, and so it was, yeah, it was, and it's less so now, um, for sure, but it's, it's still there. It's still hanging on, mm -hmm. but it's a, uh, it is, um, it is definitely different. Um, and, uh, yeah. And just, um, <clears throat> yeah. And just, again, just the ability, you know, it's just so natural, um, as an American to share, 
your feelings and and be able to be like okay this is you know how i'm feeling about x y or z and or this you know that this that or the other thing bothered me and it's and it's not always the case everywhere else and and it, and it was it's not um i'd say it's not the biggest gift here um it takes longer to to get we're, to that we're just not used to talking about how we feel yeah you know yeah. Or, or what we think and you know i can say it as an irish person and i'm i'm so proud of ireland i'm so proud to be irish i love my country mm. Um, but I'm also aware, having traveled and worked with people from abroad, and I work with, you know, in a melting pot all the time, people from Uganda, mm-hmm. people from America, Canada, Australia, whatever, each culture in general. And, you know, you can't say that one individual represents a culture, but when you are doing it for long enough and you see lots of individuals mm-hmm. from each culture, a pattern begins to emerge mm-hmm. of what each culture's strengths are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would say that we have lots of strengths in Ireland, mm-hmm. Um being friendly is one of them. Having a conversation with, with people just in the shop, you know, mm-hmm. that's something that we have that, you know, Americans don't have. Mm-hmm. And uh, it mightn't go very deep, but it's friendly. And it there's something that happens beyond the words. It's just an, mm-hmm. it's a, it's mm-hmm. a, you know, it's not saying I love you. It's saying, yeah, I like you, you know, and, yeah. I, and, and <laughs> I, you know, I want to hang out with you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, we don't say that. We just, mm-hmm. we just have a chat about the weather and chat about the football and chat about whatever else. But that's nice. It's good. It's better than not talking about the weather and the football and what and whatever else, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and we're gentle, you know. And we we we're we're um, we can fight, but we keep our sword in the scabbard most of the time. Mm-hmm. And thanks be to God, we keep our sword in the scabbard most of the time. Um, but w- it comes out in different ways. Whereas you're straight out there with what you think, and here's why I disagree with you. And I find Americans really refreshing, but really difficult to work with sometimes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's just like once you get an idea into your head, it's like, oh my goodness, you're just will you calm down, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I find it affronting, you know. Whereas I, it takes me a while. Oh, he's just American, you know. Let, <laughs> let's talk about it, okay? You know? Yeah, no, that, that's why it is. It is super important. Uh, I love culture. Um, each culture has its you know its bad points and each culture has its good points Mm -hmm. i think the problem is like when you go into a new culture what's what's going to stand out to you is going to be the things that are different that are not what you have and that the negatives will stand out to you so i think any you'll see that and then afterwards, the good things. But the yeah, first yeah. things that kind of jump out at you is like, well, why do they do it this way? Why do they say it this way? And you can kind of focus on those things. But okay, all right, well, let me help. Let me try and understand this different way of being and doing and thinking. And then um, and then also to make sure that we're focusing on the beauty and the good that's there. Totally. You know, Because there's something like, you, you know, like, so there's differences, you know. And so some of the stuff in Ireland is absolutely beautiful and, and they're doing it a better way than America. And and some stuff would be, I would be like, well, and no, actually I prefer the way that the Americans do totally. that. And so, and it's just, um, yeah. And and if you can appreciate that and, and not just focus on the negatives, um, then you can enter in more. Yeah. And, let me tell you something that I like about America, and you tell me if this makes me a bad person, all right? <laughs> so one of the things I loved, and I fell in love with America as soon as I heard the sound of a V8 or a V12 engine, yeah. you know? And, like, it was just accessible to every man. Yeah. You know, you didn't have to be a millionaire to afford yeah. a decent vehicle. Yeah, I love the fact that there's very little sales tax, so VAT, what we call VAT, yeah. you know? And in some states, there's no sales tax. Yeah. Yeah. And so it just makes things our basic necessities at this stage mm-hmm. appear affordable mm-hmm. uh, and accessible to the ordinary guy. I love that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have a different system here. Our healthcare is free. Um, I love that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's really, really good. And there's a, there's a trade off to be had there, mm-hmm. but the part of me that loves, you know, cars, you know, whatever, or, or whatever it is, whatever consumer goods are there, that, that it's really good to be able to afford those in a culture whereby, mm-hmm. you know, there's freedom there and you know there's lots of positives in both Mm -hmm. yeah no and there's and there's no perfect system if there was then probably everybody would be doing it you know um many nations with um free health care um is there's a lack of quality of care often Mm -hmm. and there's a huge weight um sometimes people die before they get what they need Mm -hmm. um let's say the health care in america is amazing but you if you get something serious and you don't have insurance, then you're in trouble, and that's the that's the problem. In America, the poor are taken care of, 
because uh, a lot of times people have this mistaken notion that like the poor just you know are left out no if when you're poor you get on medicare and medicaid yeah. you get taken care of and you get taken care of well yeah the poor are fine you know i mean you know there's not you know there's i'm sure there's it's not everything's perfect there's always gaps you know but they, they try and work totally. and then and those who are wealthy have insurance and so they're fine the middle class is where you're if you don't get it through your work it's going to be hit or miss and that is the downside of it the the upside is you know, the healthcare is amazing, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you get in right away, you get appointments right away, the care, the facilities are great, you know, your own room, like it's so much that's, so there's good aspects and there's bad aspects. It's kind of, and again, it's back to the, you know, the thing, the different things with culture, there's going to be pluses and minuses. And, um, and again, we can focus on like, oh, we have this and we do it this way and you guys don't do it that way. And why, and so ours is better. And then, so you, you automatically focus on the thing that's different from what you're used to yeah. or comfortable with or know. And there can be a, a kind of a knee jerk reaction to like, well, that's, that's wrong. That's, it should be this way. And, and so, yeah, there's totally, yeah, we're I, both. I, it's funny. You talk about healthcare. I had a moment of lucidity, uh, you know, I joined net full time in to January, 2012, running up to that in, in 2011. And it was a case of, you know, a, a big change is, is stressful. We, we have seven children. Uh, they're most of them are growing up now and left, but it was one of those moments where it was, you know, we had private health care. Uh, if our kids got sick, they got a private room, all that sort of thing. And then one of our kids actually got sick when I was working in, in ministry and, it was, I, I really experienced the Lord say to me, this is what it's, this is, this is what it's going to be like, you know? And so whatever kid was sick, I forget, was in the middle of a ward with a bunch of other kids. And I, you know, it was, it was a moment where the Lord was saying, it's not going to be that bad. It's okay. Mm-hmm. And I love people and I love chatting to people. So being in a ward with other parents and other kids who were sick wasn't that bad. In fact, it was fine. It was mm-hmm. even better. And, and, uh, the, you know, the pros and pros and cons to it. And, uh, I, what I'm saying is being in a room of your own is not all it's cracked up to be. Oh yeah. 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 Do you know? Yeah. No, it's, it's not, it, it's, I'd say, yeah, but even, um, yeah. yeah, it's not everything it's cracked up to be, but even I noticed even recently, um, when, uh, one of our friends, you know, like he was in just on a gurney in, in the hallway for the week. And that's not okay. And that's not okay. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, and so there, yeah, there's, but again, but it's great that, you know, if something serious comes up here, you know, you won't go bankrupt. You won't lose your house. And that's for huge. Sure. And that's yeah, yeah, absolutely huge. Sure. And that's the good aspect. So, you know, trying to find, you know, really creative ways that are, what's going to be the best thing to take care of our people. And yeah. and, and and there's always going to be differences and, and they'll always highlight the differences and there'll be the pluses and minuses. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you'll see some systems you're like, okay, that's just totally broken and that needs to be fixed, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, in any system. But, uh, so, so have you ministered as a priest to any other culture other than Ireland or have you been here your whole, as uh, far as priesthood? like live, I mean, I've been on many missions in other countries, but okay. never actually Lived. living okay. there. No. So yeah. 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 So, What's it like, uh, being a priest in Ireland? You know, you're, you're, you're head friar in, or the chief servant, yeah. <laughs> friar chief servant, uh, the, the servant in the house in Limerick. Are yeah. you, are you in charge of the whole of Ireland or is it just Limerick? Uh, just Limerick. Just I'd Limerick. be the, I'm the vicar for Europe. So the number okay. two guy for Europe. So oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So working with the servant for Europe. So yeah. Good yeah. You. How does that feel? Which one? <laughs> well, the first one, let's talk about that. We'll, we'll go from, you know, big picture to small picture. How does it feel being the second in command in Europe? It's a delight. I love it. Um, I have a real passion for Europe. I have for a long time. Uh, so much rich history, uh, especially with the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to seeing the direction that it's gone um, in the last, you know, 100 years or so um, is heartbreaking to see, like, these traditionally, you know, Christian and Catholic cultures just, unraveling completely and and just for the young adults just entering into this void you know which is just so vapid and just ah uh, it's yeah it's heartbreaking and and then you see all the stuff you know the spiking suicide rates the addiction the, the abuse all these different things happening um and just the emptiness and loneliness of so many people so my my heart's been here for a long time so i love it i am i'm I, w- I want to work um, strongly and for the re-evangelization of Europe. It's um, 
you know, it's, this is where, you know, the seat of the Catholic church, you know, was basic, it was led to be basically, you know, and, uh, and, in Rome, you know, and, in, and in, they, in Europe, you know, and, and that's the American culture right there. Like you're not afraid to be bold and speak about Europe. You know, I want to evangelize Europe. Yeah. And we're like, what does that even mean? You know, whereas it's so simple to you. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's like, it's really clear. It's really simple. We don't have to break it down. We'll just start at first principles, yeah. evangelize Europe, bring the gospel to Europe, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and it's uh, like, don't overcomplicate it. You know, yeah. and it's, it's really, really simple. Yeah. Go Yeah. My thing is you go in, start groups, have them start groups, spin off, you know, start fires. Yeah. And, you know, obviously one person can't cover the whole distance, but if you just go in and, work with groups, empower them, they go mm. and it spreads. And that's how the gospel, I mean, that's how the gospel spread. Yeah. You know, the, you know, the apostles went into a place, they preached the gospel, people got on board, they left, went to another place, that community grow, grew and mm. sent out people. I mean. Yeah. Are, are you, <laughs> sp speaking of which, are you in this for the long haul or do you expect Ireland and Europe to be converted in your lifetime? Uh, I'm that's, I fully expect, yeah, I expect it to be in my, my lifetime. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a bold <laughs> statement. And that wasn't a laugh. That wasn't a scoff. That was a, <coughs> a genuine cough. Wow. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Only an American could say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good on you. Yeah. 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 Um, people sometimes, you know, tell me to, uh, you know, aren't, aren't you kind of dreaming big? I'm like, should I dream small? Mm -hmm. Is my father not God? Is he not the creator of the universe and of all life? And did not a ragtag group of not well-trained or educated men go forth and spread, men and women, go forth and spread the gospel all over all, over all of Europe, you know, in, mm -hmm. a, in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So all, all we, what we need is saints who are willing to lay down their life and who truly believe in that. And, and it's going to be God's power working in them and he can do all things. So yes, I fully expect it to happen Amen. <laughs> because, and because the only other option is see, the lies never, they never persist because they're lies. That's why the image of Satan is a dragon consuming itself by the tail or a dog biting himself in the butt. You know, like every thing that Satan does unravels because it's not life giving. And something that's nice, not life-giving cannot in and of itself continue because it's not life-giving. It's death, right? The wages of sin are death, right? And so everything that, that he does will end in death. And it's, it's not going to continue on and grow because it doesn't have life, right? right? He is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Satan doesn't have that. So it's not going to—so he'll do a lot of destruction— but it's not gonna. It's not gonna. Whereas if you plant the seed of life, right? If you know you plant that mustard seed, you, you know the little bit of leaven that's from God, then the whole thing grows because it is life giving. And so, so everything that Satan do is is doing, and he's causing a lot of destruction. He's basically trying to take. You know, the ship is. You know, it looks it looks like it might be sinking. He's trying to take as many people down with him as he can, but. But God will prevail. We already know that Jesus is victorious. He's won the victory. Amen. There's no question marks. It's not like, oh, geez, I wonder how this is going to end. You know, <laughs> you know. I, I remind people all the time. I'm like, there's no a single nanosecond where God is caught off guard, where He's like, oh, I didn't see that one coming. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen next. He has a plan. He's won the victory, and it's just for us to be, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do during this time? Mm -hmm. And that's all. And that the believe that he can do amazing things through our these broken vessels of who we are, because it's his power and not ours. And one of his greatest weapons is discouragement. So we mm. need to be encouraged. Just what you're saying, you know. Let's mm. expect it. Let's let God do his bit, mm -hmm. and which is everything, mm -hmm. and us just walk in his ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from Europe to Ireland, do you want to talk about Limerick first, or do you want? Did you were you ever up in Derry? Ah, uh, no, no, just been in okay. Limerick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been there? Uh, seven years now. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's a long time to yeah. not be moved. Yeah. 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 Well, you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> what, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll probably be moved. <laughs> so. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. How do you, how do you feel about Ireland, the Irish people? I, I be, be honest. No, I love. I I mean, I growing up, uh, I was Irish American. It was, you know, for for me, it's you know the place of where my ancestors came from and. I mean, we're a little bit of a, you know, 
uh, European mix of everything, but primarily Irish. And that's what, you know, we associated with the most. And so for me, I mean, I grew up, you know, reading Irish legends and listening to Irish music. And, and so for me, it was, it was, yeah, it was always a dream to come here. When they, when they first opened the house, I had like, for lack of a better word, a vision of myself. Like I saw the, the house, I smelt the air, I felt it. I, I knew God was calling me to Ireland so I told my community and they said, no. And so I told them, so I told them a year <laughs> later, I'm like, I really, I know I'm supposed to go to Ireland. And they said, no. Uh, so I left it off for 10 years. I just said, all right, Lord, your time. And then 10 years later, they came to me and said, Hey, would you mind going to Ireland? I said, no, I knew I was going at some point. I was just waiting for you to, you know, for the Holy spirit to prompt you. So yeah, when do I leave? And so, yeah, I was delighted to come. I was saddened by just how, grievously the faith has shuff, suffered here and i didn't know that from over there when i got here i was like wow like things of the people have suffered here you know and um the faith has suffered here and it, it was it was kind of i was it was kind of shocking to me um because talk, I mean, talk about what that looks like in your head um you know how, how people have suffered and how the faith has suffered you know where the state of <clears throat> affairs basically yeah um well it took me a while i didn't know honestly why you know and i've learned a lot more now with being here just a lot of the wounds um from the mistakes of uh you know previous people in the church and the hurts Chi that have are happened you, are you talking about child sex abuse that uh all the abuses that happened you know mm. from the sisters the teacher uh, uh, everything that's been out there mm. um and because there was such a reverence for the church and at the times uh, you know i think there was those who no, I don't think I know that abuse that authority and it, to be in a very heavy handed way. Cause honestly people that want their way can just abuse authority just to well, like, because I said so. And for a long time people went along with it, but not happily. Mm -hmm. But then when all the dirt came out and all the tragedies and just the horrors of all the, the sins of, of the clergy and religious in Ireland, there was a there was an understandable backlash of we put up with your crap, you know, and your heavy handedness, and because well, father said so, our sister said so, and we felt like we had, to, and then now we're finding all this out, you know, and so there was a big fu moment from the people, and I get that, and that's tragic, and they did so much damage, you know, those who were placed in that position of, again, they they wasn't coming from a place of of love, you know. Um, and, and they were, you know, and so, yeah, I, I, I didn't understand the picture until I got here. Like what happened to the faith in Ireland, you know, uh, how did it, you know, um, fall so much by the wayside, you know, and you can point to, you know, more modern factors with the lack of catechesis now and, um, with everything just being handled in the schools and then, um, you know, so you don't really know who you're getting there. So the church mm -hmm. isn't really taking that active role in, in the catechesis of the children. Um, and so you have generations now who don't actually know their faith um, in many ways. And so, yeah, it was heartbreaking, honestly, when, when I got here. Just uh, the, the hurt that it, that I saw that, you know, it happened so, to so many people. And now, um, unfortunately, the, with that then, the rejection of the good um, mm -hmm because of the bad, yeah, you know, and that's, and then, but then what you find then is there's an emptiness because we don't have that faith grounding anymore. And I, as in the church in Ireland and the church in America, I don't want to return in any way, shape or form to the past, to the past. And nor should we, no, have you know, no that's not what the Holy spirit does. He does <laughs> no. something new. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't look back at even the, the old days as the good old days, but I think there was an, a too much of an aloofness and a separatism, um, from the clergy and the religious and uh and so H however we can look at that as an aspect of the past it's not the past mm -hmm. the past was actually reasonable there were aspects of it which were not healthy yeah, yeah whereas what we're led to believe in you know revisionist history is that was the past just all the bad stuff and we don't yeah. recognize at all 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 the oh, good yeah. stuff that the church has contributed to society yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think we have to have a balanced view oh yeah I, like i grew up in ireland I'm around the same age as you, I imagine. And I grew up really happy. 
I grew up knowing the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Kids don't know that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, ah, oh, whatever you think yourself, you know, and I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point, but yeah. you know, it's borne out in the statistics, crime statistics, indictable crime, which is crime mm -hmm. so serious that it has to be tried in front of a jury mm -hmm. is three times that, which it was 50 years ago. And it's getting worse. Yeah. You know, yeah. suicide. You, you mentioned suicide earlier mm -hmm. on. What's that like? Uh, this, uh, um, and I know you haven't tried it, but like in terms <laughs> of what, what, you know, how does that manifest in your ministry? I mean, it was just, I mean, in my own family, um, but also that's sorry. something that we've suffered with. I'm and so and, and you that. see that um, with so many people, you know, um, that it's, it's, the numbers are just so high because, you know, we need, if we don't have the hope of Jesus, you know, when all the stuff and all the pressures of the world get to us. If we have hope and we have faith, it gets us through it, you know? Yeah. Um, it gives we, us a reason to suffer. Yeah. And like, it's, and we have a belief that, okay, this suffering isn't meaningless and is a real possibility that because there is a God and he loves me, that things can get better. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have that, um, it's just, yeah, it takes us to a really dark place. Um, and it's just, so yeah, it's something that that's happening around us and we've, dealt with it in, in our, you know, with around people in our neighborhood and around people in our ministry, um, people that I've prayed with and worked with. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely tragic. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just, but for so many, it's just, it's just when they, when they find themselves in that, in that void and that blackness, we just want to escape. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, you know, I think many people, I've experienced that even in their own lives. But if, again, if you have faith, you're like, okay, but I know this isn't the answer, you know, and I know this is going to get better. And, and, and we need to be able to talk about these things. You know, honestly, that's one of the things that for me is tragic is so many things that need to be talked about. We can't talk about because have you ever experienced suicidal thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in uh, a young man and, and I was in darkness, mm -hmm. um, because I had rejected God for my life. So there's, you know, that's why I know it's a connection and entered into addiction and to, um, just merely seeking only the pleasures of the world. But, and which at times, you know, I'm not going to, sometimes the sinning was fun, but in the end you just keep drinking more and more because sin is always just, it just always leads you into deeper sin and it never satisfies. And so you get to this point of like, I'm just, you know, as I say, I was drinking deeply of everything the world had to offer and found myself dying of thirst. And I was like, what the hell's the point, you know? And so with, it was, uh, there was sometimes of this an active thought, but often it was more of, it was more of like just not wanting to live anymore just by sheer, just bad lifestyle choices. So I was like, well, I won't actually take my life, but I'll just do stupid things, mm -hmm. which will lead to my death. Mm -hmm. And then... Okay, well, I didn't kill myself. I just made bad decisions. But it was really, it's almost like suicide by, by seepage. The long, you know? the long <laughs> you know, suicide. You know. And and how, <laughs> like, how did you, how did you get out of that? I just had a conversion experience and uh, experienced the love of God. I went on this retreat with my father, that he talked me into going to. And honestly, the only reason I said it, uh, only reason I went on that retreat, I wanted nothing to do with any kind of retreat at the time. It was just to honor my father. So I had a good relationship with him. And I knew it took, you know, it, honestly, if my mom would have asked me, I would have been like, no, you know, <laughs> like piss off. I'm not going on any stupid retreat. But the fact that my dad came to me as a man and, and that wasn't something that he would normally do. And, and knowing that he was going to get rejected, but he still humbled himself to basically wow. beg me almost to come, you know, and just to open his heart again, mm. to be vulnerable and say it would mean a lot to me, son, if you'd come on this thing with me. Like I went because of that. You know, I said, okay, fine, go I'll, I'll go with, I'll go with you pops, you know, on this thing, whatever, yeah. you know? Um, and that was a weekend where I just realized for the first time in my life, how sinful I was. I had a sense in my heart. I was about to, because of my lifestyle choices, I was going to end up dead or in prison. And, uh, and, and I had a real clear sense if I die right now, I'm going to hell. Um, because I actually knew the truth. I just didn't care. I had actually actively rejected God for my life because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, by definition, mortal sin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, you know that's like uh, that's you know the the number one principle of the the satanic church is I can do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it, 
and that's um, that's how I was living my life. And so we don't even notice. We don't even know. We think it's freedom, but it's actually living the principles of the di- diabolic when we enter into that because it's just completely self focused and narcissistic and self absorbed. So it's not life giving. We're just we're just consuming and just seeking for ourselves. And in that, you, you'll never find true happiness because mm. happiness is love and love has to be given and received and expressed. But the, the really the, the principles of the, of, the, of the darkness are just purely self-focused. You know, it's, it's a narcissistic self-love um, and it's, it's consuming. Uh, and you could be describing the culture, whatever yeah. I want to do, whenever I want yeah, to do it, no, exactly. and however I want to do it. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And so, so many people don't even realize that that they're living like that's because Satan plays upon our our human nature. You know that we, there's that tendency within us to, that's his number one principle mm-hmm. to get people away from God mm-hmm. is to present them with something, and he and he always does it. He'll present us with something that seems good, you know, and um, and this. And it'll always, you know, the same way he does, you know, how, how did he convince the world that the taking of a life of an unborn child is a good thing? Well, he turned it into a women's rights issue it made about her body, about her freedoms, about her health care, her you know, health care, her femininity. Yeah. Not at all, you know, even fa- besides the innocent life that's in there, not at all factoring in. And this is, hasn't been addressed at all. And I think this will be one of the things that will be the pushback wave is when you have millions upon millions of women who have, you know, become infertile from that, you know, who have severe psychological and emotional trauma from that. And if they go back to the people who who encourage them, they're just going to say, oh, sure, it was fine. You didn't do anything wrong. It was just a blob of tissue. But that's not addressing the pain and the hurt and the heartache that's going on inside of them. And our bodies and psyches know differently. Yeah, exactly. And a mother knows. Like everything inside of her is geared towards the protection of this life within her, and then when that's violated, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking, and that's not even just. I remember one time we were out we were praying outside of an abortion facility in New York, and we were just very gently just encouraging women to say we have free you know housing and whatever you might need just so you can keep the life. And all these people who are the escorts of this place were coming up, pushing us away, yelling at us, don't listen to them. They don't give a crap about you. You know, it's okay, honey, we'll take care of you. And they're being so gentle and kind with her. Don't worry, we'll take care of you. Come on in. And and I'll never forget this moment. Um, and I was just standing there just saying and just praying, you know, and it's just like, it's just, I just want to talk to you. You know, like there's no, there's no judgment. There's no condemnation. Just come. And we, we have help. And she was looking at me, and she wanted to reach out to me, but she was being forced in by these people who were respecting her freedom and who cared so much about her. I was out there when she came out of the facility, white as a ghost, weeping, and collapsed on the sidewalk and threw up on herself. And, you know, hours later, and the same people who were like, oh, honey, we're here for you. We care about you literally turned their backs on her and walked away. And the person who they said, looking at me, who was this person that doesn't care about you and hates you, I was the one that went over and just held her in my arms and wept with her, you know? And and it's just so indicative of that whole lie, you know? I'm like, do you, you don't actually care about the woman, you know? Mm-hmm. You don't. You care about your agenda. You weren't there for her. And, and I just held her and just was rocking her in my arms and saying, it's okay, you know, you're not forsaken, you're not abandoned, you are still loved by God, and it's going to be okay, you know, and God can heal this wound. And that's a lot of the work that we've done is in post-abortion healing retreats and, and walking with these women. And so when there's going to be a generation of women who are going to come, rise up and go like, you lied to us and you didn't actually give a damn about us. And I think that's going to be the one where the real one of the real pushbacks, you know, and that's and where the where the role of churches has to be to really just keep on just saying, like, we, you are absolutely loved, and all things can be forgiven by God, and there's no judgment here whatsoever. And to make it a place where they can come and experience that freedom and that healing. Um, and it's beautiful to see it when you see women who mm-hmm. go through the whole healing process, you know, and just to see, like, new life finally coming back into them. And so, yeah, so that's one of my, the frustrations when they say it's about, you know, caring for the women. I'm like, you don't care about them. You, you, you've, you've, it's, and let's just face it, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. 
So lads, yeah. you know, come on. <laughs> that, th- thank you for being so vulnerable. And it's obvious that you care. It's obvious that you're not acting. It's obvious that this is something that you you are, you know, you're deeply convicted about. And my heart goes out to that poor woman and, you know, millions of women like her. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And what about you? How did you get out of that hole that you were in after the retreat? Um, honestly, I just, um, I, well, I was, I, I was raised with the faith, so I knew deep down it was true. I never actually re- rejected any of the tenets of the faith. I just acted like, you, you, oh, I just, I, I just rejected God because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, and so I didn't actually have a personal problem. Just, <laughs> it, was, it was a lifestyle <laughs> problem, you know? Um, and so, so you still believed in God the whole way through. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I knew right and wrong, and I just just didn't care in a lot of ways. I, just, I, just, you know, I wanted the promise of happiness, and uh, the glamour and the glitz and uh, all the sexiness and uh, the fun. And and um, again, I found it wasn't really truly life giving. And so I just I said, "All right, Jesus, um, if you're everything you say you are, and I think you are." Um, and I thought about just uh, during that week, and I heard the words "God is love," you know, from uh, John's letter. And I was like, "If if God is love, so if God is God, that means He knows everything, past, present, and future. He knows everything. He knows me better than I know myself. And if He's actually love, then somebody who knows everything and loves me sounds like a good person to trust." So I was like, "All right, here's your shot, Jesus. Full access, backstage pass, no matter what." You know me, I'm crazy, I will do anything, and I never sh- shrunk from any, you know, life-threatening or insane challenge or just nothing, wouldn't back down from anything. So I'm like, here's your shot. I'm giving you access. I'm inviting you into my heart and into my life. I will do, I will try because I've tried everything else now. I will do whatever you want me to do because if you really are who you say you are, then that will be what brings me actually to happiness, and that's what I want, happiness and joy and peace in my life. So... I invite you into my heart. Your will be done. Show me what to do. And I'll give it a go. Um, how, did, how did that manifest itself then? Well, I was like, did I got did hit he like, answer your prayer? Well, I, got, I felt like I got <laughs> hit by like a lightning bolt right away. Really? Yeah, and I was just like, and just all of a sudden it was like, the veil was like torn asunder and all the lies were exposed. And I was like, oh, crap, I need to change my life. <laughs> you know. Um, I remember I went back, started volunteering, uh, doing youth ministry, started volunteering, going to prayer groups and stuff. I was there at the church all the time, just and I was loving it, and I was full of joy. Whereas before, I'd be sitting around, you know, my roommates would come back, and I'm just sitting around, just on whatever, and just kind of, yeah, just define yeah. on whatever, like on drugs, are you saying? Yeah, drugs, alcohol, everything, you know, just you know, just um, didn't really care, you know. It just you know, people would be like, "Here, try this." I'm like, "What's this?" You know. Here, what's this? Oh, it's PCP. Oh, yeah, I'll smoke that. Whatever, you know, here, here, drop some acid. Okay, you know, whatever. I didn't really care. I was just like, <laughs> you know, wow. smoke, th- smoke this, take that. I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, because again, if you don't care if you live or die, what's the point, you know? Um, you're not, you're not afraid to do anything stupid. Um, so. Can I ask you a clarifying question? Yeah. Um, something that I've thought about uh, in terms of there may be people here who either have themselves tried LSD or, you know, psychedelic drugs or drugs mm-hmm. and, you know, and they're looking to get off it or whatever. They know somebody who's in that situation. What is it? How would you compare the faith life with the drug life? <laughs> and, not, and not talking about the addiction, talking about the high. Yeah, yeah know, no. Talking about the effects of the drugs, not the negative effects, the positive effects. Yeah, it's, it's a high with those things, but it's not real. Um, and, you know, it's not real. And then afterwards, there's always the low and and that's the emptiness and so that's how it feeds into addiction because you want to get back to the high and especially the first time you do something it's like wow that was super awesome and so you're always trying to chase that you know initial feeling um and a lot of times it can be escapism too just from all of the the crap of life so um but i can say but in the end there was emptiness i found myself getting more angry more violent more depressed um Whereas once I, once I got off everything and just started living my life for God, I just, I was happy. I was joyful. You know, I was smiling. I was laughing. I was sleep. I'd go to bed and sleep well and get up and feel good. And 
um, you know, it's like, you know, you wake up the next day, you feel like crap, then you just want to go right back into it, you know? Um, but this way I was, and so that's like the part of your brain gets shut down, you know, when you're spiking it with all this other stuff. Um, but which is the part that kind of produces normal, happy, Mm -hmm. you know, just joy. And so once, uh, I can honestly say, you know, and it's not like, oh, I really miss that old stuff, but now I'm trying to do the right thing and it's okay. You know, no, there's like people like, is there any temptation to go back? I'm like, no. It really would be like a dog returning to his vomit, you know, <laughs> you know like, why would I want to go back to that? It's just, you know, it was like, you know, and in fact, I, I did a couple of times after my conversion, I, you know, and I kind of really give him a, like, I did go back and, oh, maybe, or maybe I'm, you know, I remember some of the happy stuff. Oh, I'll try again. I was like, I, couple, I got like physically sick. Like my body was wow. like, what are you doing? No, we're not going back down that road. Again. I literally threw up, Praise you God. know, it was just like, my body was like, no, we're not putting that crap back in a snope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're not doing it. <laughs> so, um, and it just was not a pleasing experience at all, <laughs> you know? And it was just like, so there's not any temptation to go back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the joy and the peace that I have in my life far exceeds everything that I experienced in the past, you know? Um, and so it's, it's actually, it is, it's not just like, well, I was doing bad before, but now I have to do the right thing. It's like, no, I want to do this. And there's not a part of me that wants to do what I was doing. It's empty. It's not actually joyful, you know? Mm. And so the joy and the happiness I feel was way better than any, I mean, I remember one time I was, I was praying when I was discerning the priesthood and I remember I got hit with like this, um, I was like, Lord, that's what do I know if this is really from you? And I got hit with like just, I guess the best, best way I could call it would be like this little smallest taste of the joy of the Lord, of like his, like of maybe a taste of heaven. And oh my gosh, it was electric. It was like, you felt like you could run a million miles and fly and just, you're just laughing and so full of joy. And I remember thinking like, this is so better than anything by far than I ever had before. And that was just the smallest little, little taste, you know, I was like the fullness of that, which awaits us in heaven. You know, that's a tragedy is that people lose that for a lie, for a, 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 a fake, something that's fake, you know, Mm. and it's not actually, you know, they're not, you know, and and you ask people, you know, when they're, you know, and I, I, I walk the streets a lot and I talk to addicts and, and, and they're not happy, <laughs> you know, there's nothing about them that's happy, you know, and even people that are living just like the, the whole party life, um, there's an emptiness that's there. And, um, and so, but yeah, when I experienced something of the joy of the Lord, just when it came down on me, it was just, I've just never experienced anything like it. And, not, and I haven't really experienced it to that degree ever again. And I don't need to, but I remember it. I, I think like, Wow, that was good. <laughs> you know, I, that, I, I want that yeah. for eternity. Yes, yeah. you know. So. Amen. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. It, do you ever look forward to that eternity? Mm-hmm. Oh, geez, all the time. Yeah. Mm. Um, I love to ponder what heaven will be like. You know, I think it's um, it's, it's safe to say it'll be the fulfillment of all our desires. And some people are like, well, I suppose I desire X, Y, or Z. I'm like. Well, our desires are perfected there. Like you won't desire anything that's yeah. that's not that's not good for you. <laughs> that's not fulfilling, you know. Yeah. So it's not like God's going to be like, no, you can't have that. You won't ask for it because you'll be fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think I think that the uniqueness, like each one of us is, God is the artist, and each one of us is a unique work of art of the Lord, and He made each one of us uniquely different, and each one He takes delight in each of His creations, and and he delights in that. And who we are was what was who we truly are, not all the woundedness and the baggage and all the other stuff that we pick up, but our true self is created by God. And I don't think that gets all like whitewashed in heaven, but perfected. And so I think the perfection of his artwork will become will come forth in heaven. And so everyone in that sense will experience heaven differently because everyone is different and it'll be the fulfillment of all of our desires. You know, Jesus is the, is the fulfillment of our desires and, and that the uniqueness of who each one of us is will be brought to its fruition in heaven. And so I think sometimes people have this mistaken notion of heaven, like, okay, well, we all, 
well, I have to be goody two shoes now and sit around in our right robes and play harps and sit on the cloud. I'm like, no, that is absolutely not the truth. It's the fullness of, of who you are. And, and you know, I believe that and, God... And God's not taking anything from us. No, It's exactly. not a, I'll give you this, but I'm going to take that. Right, exactly, you know? yeah. Yeah, and I believe that um, my heart has always been wild. And, and God gave you that. And he gave it to me. Yeah. And I think that's going to be perfectly my wild heart <laughs> will be fulfilled in heaven. And he, he wants me to use it here. If I, he said that to me, like, I'm not asking you not to be wild. I love that you're my wild child because I made you that way, but I want you to be wild for me. Can you do that? And I'm like, yeah, you know, and that was fulfilling. Mm-hmm. And so to be wild for Jesus, you know, um, and I think, but I, I think in heaven, then for some people, they would, you know, like, you know, every, again, everyone's hearts differently, but the fulfillment's, of what, what you know, I think about, like, you know, my wild heart, like how would it be filled in heaven? You know, what kind of, you know, adventures, you know, would I be able to do with Jesus, you know, cause he's omnipresent to each person there. Uh, cause he's outside of time and space. Uh, and I'm like to see some of the beauty of who, you know, Jesus is and what he's done, you know, to see his creation, to see, and I like, even to something like Jesus, I would love to see like a star go supernova. <laughs> you know, like you created the stars, you know, can you show me, <laughs> can you, can you just take me? So that's some of your beautiful artwork, some of these planets and stars all around the universe that you, I'd like, I'd love to see some of your works of art. And I think you'd be like, yeah, cool. Let's go check it out. <laughs> you know? Praise God. You know, I love that you, I love that you appreciate the, my art and that you want to see some of it. I'm like, yeah, I'd love to, you know? So yeah, it's just going to be, I love to ponder what that would be like. Um, and is that prayer? I say yes, absolutely, yeah. Mm. As uh, was it um, Saint Teresa of Avila, I think, that said, uh, you know, loving glance to our Father towards our Father in heaven is prayer. Mm. You know, um, mm. yeah, just sitting with the Lord. You know, I love, I love, um, you know, Mary Martha's sister. You know, that she had chosen the better part, and it wouldn't be taken away from her. And the better part was she was just sitting at the feet of Jesus and just listening to him. Mm. Uh, she wasn't doing anything. She was just. I just want to be in your presence, you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and amen. that was the better part. That's prayer. You know? I, I, and I feel like, uh, so I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like, and my experiences with the Grey Friars, that you guys are incredibly well formed, but you have a sense of who God is in a way that you're, that other orders maybe don't have to the same clarity. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, I'm very, very particular that I want a Grey Friar with the missionaries for the first two weeks of training, mm. simply because I know and trust you and I know that you're going to bring them on, mm. you know, who God is, who he is in relation to you. Mm-hmm. Um, like you have a sense, we've just heard, you know, who, who, who God is to you. Um, but that's, I, you know, we would say that's bred into you. That's formed in you, in mm. your training, in, mm-hmm. your, in your, you know, you know who God is. Mm-hmm. And I would say that, the the we have you know in the Irish priesthood we don't know so here here here's a here's a thing you're dealing with the very poor in Limerick but you're also dealing with the radicals people who are really into their faith so your life is pretty simple you don't have to deal with the silent majority that's ap- apathetic mm. do you know what I mean mm. and maybe you do and correct me if I'm wrong whereas the diocesan priests are they're dealing with everybody mm-hmm. and they don't like the the, the the radicals are not drawn to them as much. Mm-hmm. They're drawn to the likes of yourselves mm-hmm. who are living an incredibly radical life. And wh- when I say the radicals, I mean people like me who, you know, are convicted about their faith and wanted, you know, I don't want to say this in a way that I'm tooting my own horn. I'm not tooting my own horn, but I genuinely want to be a better person. I want to live my life for God. I want to, you know, it's my primary purpose in life. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I want to bring my kids up in the faith. I want to be a good husband. I fall at all these things, but that's my my desire. And the likes of me is drawn to you, mm-hmm. all right? And the diocesan priesthood gets a little bit of my time, but the likes of yourselves, the majority, let's say. And that, that's, if it's true for me, it's true for I, I don't know, I'm not using a syllogism. I know that people are drawn to the CFRs mm-hmm. and orders like you particularly, and we all have our own favorites, whereas it's harder to be a diocesan priest, mm-hmm. all right? And, mm-hmm. you know, my heart goes out to the guys. Um, they're, they're, they're um, at least you have the excuse that you're American and you weren't here during the abuse. Mm-hmm. Like, they dress like priests. They're, you don't dress like a, 
traditional priest. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, many of them are getting spat at. They're dealing with the humdrum, the ordinary, the people who have a little faith or none mm -hmm. who want, you know, just the, the, they're dealing with the apathy and, and whatever, and they don't get to associate with people who are radically converted, mm -hmm. whereas you guys do. Speak to that. Yeah, no, there's absolutely a truth to that. It's a more difficult life for sure. <laughs> I think that's why I was never drawn to it, you know. Um, so so you're, here's a guy, you've just rocked up to this house. I don't know what car you drove, but I imagine it's not very good. You live in a in Moira Ross, which is one of the worst areas of Ireland, and you're saying that the diocesan priest has it harder. Yeah, in a lot of ways, for sure. There's a, there can be a loneliness um, you're, you know, everything, I think maybe the struggle for the diocesan priests and for the bishops and for the church in general right now is trying too hard to pre please everybody. Um, end of the day, you have to just, you know, say what you need to say. Um, are you going to piss off a lot of people? Yeah. Are you going to lose some of your congregation? Yeah. Are you going to get transferred are you gonna, out well, to <laughs> one of the islands <laughs> off the coast of Donegal? That's, uh, that's, <laughs> and that's where we can't placate, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, we can't placate the media or, or, you know, or those who are against the church right now. The government, you know, people in government, whoever they hate us anyway. Yeah, exactly. So stop trying to placate them. Just you know, in fact, if we and were, if they, we, they don't even respect us. No, because we're not even because, yeah. man enough to actually stand up for what we actually believe in. Exactly. Yeah. So let them get pissed off. Yeah. You know, if uh, all of us were doing it all the time, they'd get bored of reporting on it mm -hmm. because, we're like, sure, that's just how they are. Mm -hmm. But right now, it is one voice speaks up, and you're gonna get pounced on, and then. Everybody else is going to be like, whoa, did you see what happened to him? I'm not going to go there. And that's not the answer. You know, the answer is, you know, there's never, it's never going to be no matter how much we try and talk about, you know, politically correct things, you know, like, you know, global warming or recycling or things that everybody's like, okay, that's warm and fuzzy or, you know, uh, animal welfare or whatever. Things that are like, you know... Things that will won't be controversial and people will, you know, they're still not going to like, you know, the enemies of the church are never going to like the church and they're always going to seek to destroy it and they still want it gone. So just say the truth with love, with love, let them attack you and keep going. And, and again, and they'll get bored of it eventually. Mm, you know? <laughs> and don't self emasculate, you know, yeah. don't like stop neutering your, our, ourselves. You yeah, know? exactly. No, just say it, you know, and, um, and, and don't be afraid. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think we really need to work on. And, and, um, I think for, for the diocesan priest, you know, what's, what's necessary there. I mean, and how do you, how do they bring in, like you said, like, you know, cause they got everybody. I think that the first step is that we're all, that we're, we need to, each one of us individually needs to pursue radical holiness and a relationship and an intimacy with the Lord. And that will... You know, man, like, why was St. John Vianney so popular? Because he was holy. How was he holy? Uh, How did he get to be that holy? Right. It was, I mean, a radical life of prayer and penance, you know, mm -hmm. and, and a, just a radical life of love of God. And he loved God and he loved his people, and that was manifested through his words and actions. They say he wasn't even a good preacher. Like, it wasn't his preaching. It was his holiness of life, you know. And no matter what, you're going to have enemies and you're going to have people trying to tear you down. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, end of the day, you know, you I love them and, you know, and you try and... And and we have to be really clear, this is not, you know, Father Joseph Mary and Tony Foy piling on the, the diocesan priests in Ireland. I wouldn't want their job. It's really, really mm. difficult. Mm. And, you know, you just said it's probably harder than... They don't have the community that you have. Mm. You go home... You're at home. You've got guys that you pray with, guys that will actually hold you accountable as well. Yeah. You know, hey, Father Joseph Mary, you've had three drinks. You know, maybe you've had enough or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. and you give them permission, they give you permission, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's nobody at home whenever mm -hmm. a diocesan priest closes the door behind him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that can be really lonely. Mm -hmm. And and what you know, what can lay people do for, for 
our diocesan priests. I mean, and, and our bishops, I would, I would say, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, what I find about the bishops is, and I'll let you answer the question in a second. Before, they really didn't realize how bad it was. Just like you're saying, you've come to Ireland, you're here seven years, you, you got a shock about how really radically w- a wasteland Ireland is in terms of faith, and there are pockets of faith, but it is really not in a good place. I don't think the bishops were aware of that because people were still attending the church. Mm-hmm. No. Attendance has fallen massively, and they are in a place where they actually know that they don't know what to do, and they realize the problem. Mm. And, you know, at, we're in a good place in that they know that they don't know what to do. At least they can come and look for mm-hmm. help in places that are obviously producing fruit for mm. the like of yourself. But anyway, what can lay people do for for yeah. the priests, yeah. the diocesan <coughs> priests in particular? Yeah, and again, what I was saying earlier, I mean, just is I was saying for each one of us, me and you, and I'm not saying f- the first step is pursuing radical holiness for each one of for us. For ourselves. Yeah. That's, and that's what, a, that's what will bring other people, you know, cause I, see how something. Do, how do you that. do that? Um, well, it's, you know, you live in the life of prayer and, and penance and living and really seeking what's the Lord asking of us individually. I think that's one of the biggest keys. And I think that's one of the biggest things that's lacking right now in so much of the church is uh, discernment. You know, if I could say one word that I feel like we really need to grow in is discernment. Um, because otherwise we can spend money and time and all on all these endeavors and initiatives and projects. If it's not of God, it's not going anywhere. It's dead in the water. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders build in vain. Amen. So that's probably, and that's one of the things that I feel our house tries to really push into, you know, and when we go to each other and we really like pray, like before we do things, okay, what do we feel like the Lord is saying? Somebody said, I don't know where they got it from, but somebody had an interesting quote recently, which I really loved that was purgatory is full of people who did lots of good things, none of which were the Lord's ideas or initiatives. Mm-hmm. It's not just doing good things, but because, you know, and the Lord talks about like, we did this and we did this and we did this. And the Lord's like, I never knew you. You didn't actually have a relationship with me. You didn't actually ask me what I wanted. And for me, it's just like Jesus himself. Okay. He's God, (laughs) right? He's the Messiah. He's God incarnate. He's the son of the father. Jesus himself for him to say and mean it. I can only do what the father tells me to do. And for him to keep going away into prayer early in the morning, late at night, out on the water, out into the desert, out into the mountains. Jesus himself wasn't just stepping out there and going, let me figure this thing out. He was saying, Father, what do you want me to do? And he would only move on that. That's the model that he left for us. And if we're not doing that, you know, we're pissing in the wind. Pardon the expression, you know. We're not doing anything because... You know, what does the Father want? And if the Father's anointing is on it, then we can, it'll take off beyond our wildest dreams and expectations. Like, holy cow, how did that get so, um, because it was God's plan and his anointing was on it. Another thing, we could have the best plan in the world and the speakers and this, that, and the other thing, and we can have all these things in place. And um, tank. Right. Yeah. Um, I remember um, reading in, uh, it was, it was one of my favorite parts in that, in that, uh, the book of the Protestant pastor who went to New York City to work with the gangs there, the called the Sword and the Swiss Blade. Yeah, the Cross yeah. and the Swiss Blade, yeah. And uh and uh the Cross and the Switch Blade, yeah. <laughs> Sword and Switch Blade be two weapons. <laughs> 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 the, the cross and the Switch Blade. But I remember he had, he planned this whole big huge event and his wife had told him before, You're trying too hard. You're trying to do this, you know, and he had this whole thing planned and this by people bust in and this whole arena rented and it was absolute chaos, this anarchy. And he just felt so convicted. He's like, you're trying to do this. You're not, you're not letting me do it. And he just surrendered and said, you know, father, I can't do anything to help these kids. You have to. And he just stopped in the midst of all the chaos and bottles being thrown and fights breaking out and just knelt and prayed and just said, I surrender. Father, you're all be done. You you need to touch their hearts. You need to change their lives. And he just prayed, and they just were heckling him and, and just cursing, and then little by little it got quieter and quieter and quieter, and then he just started hearing sniffles and whimpers. And 
And then all of a sudden, just ones and twos, and then in droves, they started coming down and wanting to give their lives to Jesus, you know? Um, because he wasn't trying to do it by his own power. So if we're trying to do it by our own power, we're dead in the water. Um, and that's why we really need discernment. Okay, Lord, you know, Father, what is your will here? What do you want me to do? And so when you're back to the initial question, how do we grow in holiness? Is we pursue what God is asking us to do. And that, that requires discernment, you know? Mm. And um, it's Gosh, not, you're really speaking to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lord, do you really want me to do a podcast? <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, no. So it's just, um, yeah. And so it's just, we, if we just keep pursuing that, and that's what I think is most, I'd say, lacking in the church right now, um, across the board, full stop, not pointing not in any one direction. Yeah. Can I, can I speak to the positive in that? And uh-huh. it's not to contradict you, but to give uh-huh. an example of somebody in the church in Ireland that actually does that really well. And that's Bishop Alan McGookian. He was here in, in Rufo Diocese. And, you know, I was, I was asking him questions many times. Of, you know, he was here in the house and then he, we did a podcast with him. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing I learned from him most, and it's not just a Jesuit thing. They don't have a monopoly on discernment was, yeah. you know, we're going <laughs> to have to discern that. And he would stop in the middle of a conversation. And he'd say, let's pray. Mm-hmm. You know, happy, comfortable there, man of prayer, authentic. And I, fu- I funny, I met him during the week and it was just good to see him. You know, <laughs> like he fathered us at a time mm-hmm. whenever we were very vulnerable. And when I say us, I mean the diocese. Mm-hmm. He fathered the diocese. In COVID, he was up saying the rosary and on Tubber Doon every night, you know, mm-hmm. and like just really, really, oh, yeah. we got close to him. Mm-hmm. You know, we got mm-hmm. to like him. We got to love him. And when you see the fruits of that, do you see the fruits? Yeah. yeah you and see that's, the fruits? What, that's why. So I'm not saying it's absent, but I say it's the thing that's lacking. It's there in places, but it, mm-hmm. that's the thing that we need to grow into the most. And that's the thing that I think is, you know, one of the things that's most lacking. Um, and it's beautiful when you see it in action because you see the fruitfulness of it, you know, mm-hmm. um, and you see what God can do then. And then it was like, okay. And we've just seen it in so many different ways um, where it's like when made tough decisions or, calls and then but we prayed about it and we're like no i think god's asking this so let's go we're gonna do that you know and um and if we really trust in that you know and then and that and that but it goes back to also the life of prayer you know mm-hmm. um you know saint ignatius of loyal would say you can't be a person of discernment unless you're a person of contemplative prayer you need to be somebody who's spending time listening to the lord and that's what, and that's what jesus himself did he went out into the silence mm-hmm. to speak with the father and that's fine for you. Or, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> like, and, I, and I'm saying this, I, uh, I'm juxtaposing your position uh, with my position. I pray a lot every day, mm-hmm. all right? And prayer, spending time is not something I have a problem with. I'm mm-hmm. a bit of an introvert, so I enjoy that time alone. Mm-hmm. I'm not always productive in prayer. And I use that word advisedly. Mm-hmm. What would you say to the ordinary lay person about a prayer time? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what should that look like generally? Without getting into too many specifics, yeah. Well, I, I stay away from specifics because everybody's going to be a little bit different of how they. I'd say, you know, you definitely want some silence. I think that's across the board. Turn off the phone. Yeah, we need silence. You know, that's Jesus gave us that example. He went out into the silence. Um, so I think that's a that's a full stop. You know, everybody needs that in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as other stuff, you know, um, in the scriptures, you know praying with the scriptures and some time for silence. If you can start and especially if you can incorporate that with Eucharistic adoration, that's the best way to begin. You know, yeah, Eucharistic adoration for me is where it's at. Like, yeah. I, like even just being in the tabernacle when the door is closed, yeah. mm-hmm. it, like Jesus is, he's there. Yeah, like yeah. Guess what? It's actually real. The Eucharist is true. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's a gift to us. And mm-hmm. like for, for me personally, like I just, I just feel so drawn to, mm. to the Eucharist. Um, it's, it, yeah, he's, he's what a gift to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then as far as other stuff and, and there's plenty of stuff out there to help people, like, how do I pray with the scriptures? How do I, how do I grow in contemplation? How do I grow in discernment? You know, there's so many Catholic authors that are either writing, you know, new stuff or there's the saints or there's people who are breaking down the saints into a much more, because sometimes some of the saints writings get overwhelming. So you have people that break down, like, you know, here's what St. Ignatius is saying about, you know, mm-hmm. discernment, you know, mm-hmm. in a, in a handy smaller book, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and then we just push into it. Um, and you know, and not being afraid to fail, you know, um, you go into it and you, and you make, 
you start to listen to the Lord. Don't overthink it. It's a gift, first and foremost. So it's not something, you know, that you can earn or like, you know, I've put in the hours now and so I get a promotion, you know. It's a gift. And so one of the first steps is ask for the gift. (laughs) Lord, I want to know you more. I want to know you better. I want to hear your voice. Like, Jesus, please speak to me. I want to know your voice. I want to hear you. And to have an encounter with the person of Jesus, I think that's absolutely a vital thing as well. Uh, There's many people who can go through a life of uh, being a faithful Catholic and don't actually ever encounter Jesus or have an experience of him. It doesn't mean like necessarily like a supernatural, you know, like, you know, lights coming down, (laughs) you know, but, but just to hear the voice. And, and Mother Teresa, I remember in one of her final letters, so telling, if you get a chance to read it, is one of her final letters to her sisters, and that's what she speaks about. And these were nuns who were praying, like, you know, how many hours a day? And she said, you know, as I sit here, I'm worried that some of you sisters don't actually know Jesus. You haven't heard his voice speaking to you in, in, in the silence and, and calling to you and talking to you and haven't had that real personal encounter with him, you know? So it's not just sheer hours, Mm -hmm. you know, but Mm -hmm. it's, and it's just a gift. And, but it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a prayer that Jesus is always going to want to answer. You know, Jesus, like some things you'll be like, you know, you might not get the answer you want to that. But if you're saying, Lord, I want deeper intimacy with you. I want to know what your will is. And I want to do it. I want to, I want to grow closer to you. I want to love you more. He's never going to be like, well, no, uh, probably not for you. Like he's always wants deeper intimacy with us and relationship with us. Each one of us is uniquely his child and he longs for it. And the way a parent longs for love and connection with their children, he longs for that with each one of us. And so he's never going to say no. Um, if we're truly seeking that, he will answer that prayer. When's the last time you had an encounter with Jesus or an intimacy, an intimate moment with him? I, remember, I mean... It happens all the time in small ways, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like where I just... Tell, tell me about it, the last time it happened in a small way. I mean, well, one day I just, one that just first came to my mind was just, because um, it involved discernment too, I was just, I was over in Spain. I mean, there's there's been other ones since then where I just, but I don't know, this one just kind of, because it illustrates discernment Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell, I'll share with you after after yeah. you share with me. Yeah, there's, um, just recently I was in Spain and... Um, this one just kind of, we were going to go downtown to this place where I feel like the Holy Spirit's asking the friars to establish uh, a mission there in Barcelona. Praise God. And um, only in Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> and to push into the mainland Europe and again yeah, for the yeah. re evangelization of Europe. And so, and I've been working with tons of young adults there who are just really hungry for formation. So we're going to this one neighborhood um, to where the, where the poor were. And uh, there's a lot of immigrants there, a lot of drugs, a lot of prostitution, violence. People are afraid to go there at nighttime. It's a rough town anyway. Um, in this area in particular. Mm. And, and I feel I feel like what the Lord's put on my heart is that he wants me to do the side note. Um, like too often with the poor, uh, we give them things and that's good. The corporal mm-hmm. works of mercy are important. Jesus mm-hmm. himself said so. But if you look at the life of Christ, he wasn't doing the corporal works of mercy, but his, his opening, as he began his ministry, you know, he would have the poor would, would have the good news preached to them and that to set the captives free and to break the fetters and the yokes. And he's not talking about literally setting captives free like, you know, hostages or something, mm-hmm. but but those who are enslaved to sin and addiction. And so, you know, so he would, how did he do that? Through healing people and through casting out demons, right? And so... Um, I feel like the Lord's saying with the gifts of the spirit, they're not being used enough for the poor. Um, we'll run life in the spirits at parishes, but the notion that the Lord put into my head was, you know, you guys are moving in deliverance and, and life and, and the gifts of the spirit and inner healing ministry. Do that for my lost sons and daughters because nobody's really will not say nobody, but that's not happening very often. And that's the only way they're going to find freedom from the chains of sin and addiction that they're in. And so my, the, what I felt like the Lord's asking me to do is to go there and to, to run life in the spirits, to do inner healing ministry, to do deliverance ministry, to do those things so that the poor will actually be set free. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it'll be messy and, yeah, and, as and it always wild. Is. And, and, but that's, but, but if it's the Lord's initiative and I believe it is, then it'll be super anointed. 
So we were gonna we were going down that one night, and we were supposed to go with a big group of young adults, but nobody showed up except for one girl. And the priest was like, "Ah, look, we'll just leave it off." Then nobody showed up. I said, "Well, we need to pray first, you know." And so I just went over to the church. And I'm like, "Lord, what what do you want? You know, well, we'll, if you want us to leave it off, we leave it off." And the words that just came to me right away were, "Would you go for only one?" I said, "Well, yeah." I, I, I would, and I thought for a second. I said, "Yeah, I would, I would go for only one." And then I just heard the Lord say, then go. So I told the priest, and I'm like, all right, we're going. He's like, why are we going? I'm like, the Lord said, will you go for only one? And then he said, and I said, yes. And he said, then go. <laughs> and so he's like, all right. So we went. And then as we went, uh, their young adults found out we were there. And little by little, they started trickling in and ones and twos and threes. And by the time we were done, we had a big group. So I'm like, oh, that was already a sign we were supposed to be there. And then we went down to this area where I feel like the Lord wants us to establish a mission, um, like a permanent presence, presence there. And, um, and in the end, nobody talked to us. And then when we were leaving, we were praying for each other as we were departing. And these girls were watching us. And the, the, the curiosity got a hold of one of them. She came down and she was like, what, um, um, it's like, what are you guys doing? And so we explained it. And she's like, well, what are you doing right now, though? And this group, we're like, well, we're praying for each other. And she's like, oh, okay. And she started to walk away. I'm like, can we pray for you? And I'd really love to pray for you. And she was like, Okay. And so we kind of, she kind of got in. We all gathered around and started praying with her, and and started sharing. And the Lord just gave me some really powerful, really clear images for her. And we're praying for her, and then she just uh, started weeping. And I was just like, and to start sharing with the Lord was sh- sharing on my heart for her. Could you? Are you? Would you be comfortable sharing what image you got or images you got for her? Or is that appropriate? Um. I, I don't even remember them that clearly, to be okay. honest with you. I mean, they're, they're somewhat clear, but it was in that moment for her. Yeah, yeah. And it happened, you know, we do it so often that it, it wouldn't do it justice. It'd be a bit muddled. Okay. But it was <laughs> really know? clear. And yeah. It, and it, it really, spoke to her. Yeah. It was and, God speaking to her. And she was just weeping and just so grateful. And she was, she just looked at me and said, I just, you don't, you have no idea how much I needed to hear those words, you know. And um, it was really beautiful. And then we started walking away and we went back to the cars and we're like, all right, well. And I'm like, somebody's like, well, we didn't get to meet many people, but we met one person. And I was like, and I was like, oh, Jesus, that's what you were talking about. It was like, I thought he meant it in like a figurative way, you know? And he was like, you literally meant, would you go down there for one, mm-hmm. my one daughter that needed prayer tonight? Mm-hmm. Would you guys drag your butts all the way down here just for her? You know, and it's just, and those things happen just so often, but it was just, you know, just the one that just most recently just really spoke to my heart of just the Lord's this sending us just for her mm. um and just you know and our willingness to say yes we'll go for the one Amen. she's worth it you know Amen. and uh and just and his, his presence was so palpable i just felt in that moment he was just you know hugging us and just thanking us you know but i mean you know every day we're praying and just we hear the voice of the lord every day just telling us you know just just you know every day in prayer we're discerning things and just getting all right lord what do you want to say about this or mm. as that a pilgrimage to him uh, you know, Greece and the footsteps of St. Paul and just, you know, the different places, like, Lord, what do you want to say here? Like, what are you trying to say to us in this moment? And and so he's just always, just always there. And speaking. so you're, you're, I'll share with you in a second, but you're there, you're living a radical life, you're a priest, okay? Mm-hmm. You're wearing a habit and you're giving your life completely to God and you're in full-time ministry all the time. Do you think that he will communicate with lay people in a way mm-hmm. that he did with you mm-hmm. or does with you? Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of, um, in fact, that's the retreats I've been doing in Spain. And I'd, we've done some here too as well. Is this really, but especially there, the young adults are like, they want to move in the gifts of the spirit and to say like, we want formation. Mm. How do we move? You know, how do we hear Jesus more clearly? And, uh, and then, so we did a lot of retreats and I really challenged them and I was so proud of them. They stepped up, they started ministries. They, they went out and there's, there's so many glory stories. I, and I told them, I was like, I, I was like, you're, you know, you're okay. You brought me here for this retreat and you want me to come back when I come back next year. If I'm hearing about what you guys are thinking about doing or what you'd like to do a year from now, I'll be thoroughly pissed off and I will walk away. <laughs> I don't want to hear about what you would like to be doing and what you've been thinking a year later from now. What am I doing here then? I'm wasting my time. I'm like, I want to hear about what's been going on. I want to hear glory stories. I want to hear how you've been starting initiatives and how you've been going out to the streets and to his people and how you've been praying with people. That's what I want to hear. 
And there was a, the, the number of people that, you know, said afterwards are like, there's times where they felt like a prompting of the Holy Spirit to pray with somebody. And they were like, nah, there's one guy who was like, He's like, nah, I was like, I got my groceries and I got to get him back to the apartment. And then he went to his apartment and then, but the whole time he kept on hearing my voice. He's like, oh, father Joseph's going to kill me. You know, <laughs> you know, he's going to be so pissed, you know? And then he's like, okay, fine, Lord, I'll go. And then he's like, and then right then it started pouring rain. And it's like, the guy's not even there anymore. He's gone. But it, I just kept on like, father Joseph's going to kill me. <laughs> you know, he's like, and he felt like the prompting of the spirit just pushing him. And so he went back, found the guy. It was in a really dark place, prayed with him, started bringing him to prayer group. He had a whole conversion experience, you know. Oh, wow. Thank it's just, you, Jesus. You know, it's just, you know, it's just, the, 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 if we're because open. Because he listened to, to you, yeah. and he listened to God. And he listened to the Holy Spirit's promptings, yeah. you know. It's like the Holy Spirit's going to prompt you, but it, if you if you refuse to act on it, he's actually going to stop because it's actually going to be part of your condemnation. Hmm. Like, you know, to whom much is given, and much is expected. You want to grow in these gifts, and then the Lord gives them to you, and then you don't do anything with them. That's not okay. And and you're going to see, like, all those times, like, what happened to that person that the Holy Spirit prompted you to go to, and you didn't. So actually, in his mercy, sometimes it'll hold back on it then. He's like, no, because it'll actually be, it'll actually be damning to your soul. because all You're not going to act. If you're not going to act on it. So it's like people that say they want these gifts, I'm like, okay. Yeah, you better act. You, you better then, and if you want to grow in those... You're going to step out. You know, you got to go out further on their limb, you know. Mm. Um, you know, you got to take the risk. You got to take the leap of faith. Um, mm. That's how it's going to happen. And so it's just really beautiful to, you know, hearing. It's happened some with some of the young adults we've been working with in Ireland. It's been great to see them moving in that way. Um, and it's and so it's happening all over. And there's a hunger. And, and, and that's something that appeals to young people is a challenge. Because this is challenging. It's exciting. Mm-hmm. It's a little risky. It's risky. Yeah. It's risky. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because they, they don't want just, you know, you know, sitting They want the, radical. Yeah, exactly. They, they don't want sitting in the pew. No. And, and they obviously do want to sit in the pew for mass. <laughs> yeah. But they don't want just to be that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The radical life of faith <laughs> and, and taking risk. And so, and it's exciting. Yeah. Um, and the faith, living the faith is exciting because you don't know where you're going to end up, you know. I've been all over the world. I don't, I've never know. I mean, there's so many times I'm like, how did I get here? Like, what the heck am I doing here? You know? <laughs> I'm like, there's times I'm just looking, I'm like, all right, Lord, you had a plan. I'm like, I have no idea how I got here, but. Amen. Praise God. You know? Yeah. I, I'm going to share with you two things. Um, one is really benign where it was a case of, you know, the, I felt the prompting of the Lord asking me to pray for what it is he wants next mm-hmm. in my life, you know, and, or what more can I give him? And I just had an image of a, of a safe that could be turned and unlocked and then underneath stairs. So he was taking me somewhere, you know, hopefully higher. And it was just, it, it was for me, hard to explain. And then a second uh, second experience today, um, I've had a really tough year, like really been persecuted. And it's been just a, a, a year from that God has been working on my heart in a good way. Like the persecution has been a gift, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's it has been, uh, you know, Ask, it's called me to question that which I'm doing mm. in terms of the ministry, all that type of thing. And it's really led to a, a refining and a honing of what we're, what we're, what I'm about, what I'm doing. Anyway, I'm here and at mass this morning, there was an alumni, uh, she, she did net a few years ago. She ended up marrying an Irish guy, Abigail, mm-hmm. you know, Abigail, yep, married to James. Abigail was at mass <coughs> behind me this morning. I'm looking at the church. I end up sitting at the back left hand corner of the church and like there's a, 120 people at daily mass in Stranorda. Like, what is God doing in this parish? You know, this place isn't that big that you have 120 people there. And it was just a moment of lucidity where, you know, I felt like, you know, when you have holy tears coming, mm-hmm. you know, and not in a, an effeminate way or whatever, they're just holy tears. And mm-hmm. the Lord is really saying, like, you know, not even stick with it. It's just like there were no words said, but it was just this moment of God is so good. You are so good, you know, that this is the pain and the suffering are worth it. My little tiny bit that I can throw in the pot is worth it. And he is turning me into what it is he wants me to be through through the pain and the suffering. Mm. And because I'm not big enough or I'm not good enough to bring penance upon myself a lot of the time, he has to work, you know, to, <laughs> to hold me through through suffering. And uh, yeah, it was just a, this beautiful moment that I can know 
I knew could only be from him. And it happens sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, but not all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that was my encounter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what what about the diocese? What can we do? Like we we did a <clears throat> interestingly we did a retreat for the diocesan priests before COVID, and we got a, a guest speaker to come along. And you know, I was planning the day with him, and he was like, "Well, you know what? I'm going to tell those priests what for." And I'm, I'm like, Tony, you need to say something here. And I I said to him, "Look, that is not what you're going to say. You know, you're not going to give out to these guys. They need they need your love. They mm-hmm. need your help. They need your encouragement." They're the, these are the very guys who are coming to a priest retreat that Nat was helping out with as well. These are the very guys that actually need support, mm-hmm, you know, and mm-hmm. the last thing that they want is for the guest speaker to rip into them. You know, and, and I know you, you guys do a priest retreat uh, mm-hmm. for, for diocesan priests. Tell us about that. Yeah. It kind of <clears throat> came from, um, a lot of the inspiration came from, um, the book um, Encino Jesu, just kind of like the Eucharistic uh, reflections from one of the Benedictine monks there in Silverstream, and um, and uh, that our our Lord and Our Lady were talking about Knock being a place of priestly renewal, mm-hmm. and it made sense um, that in particular Our Lady revealing herself as both, and that's why like the beloved disciple and Joseph are both there, like. Because, you know, it kind of makes more sense of the apparition. Like that Mary is both mother and spouse in a particular way to priests. Mm-hmm. Like every nun is like a spouse of Jesus. But like Mary try, is really particularly, like particularly graces for priests of both mother and spouse, right? And so like the, the both those aspects. And so Jesus, you know, God is our father, but Jesus is also the, he's the bridegroom, you know, as mm-hmm. well to the church and to the, and the sisters consecrate themselves to him and, mm-hmm. And so that she really wanted it to be a place of special graces there for priestly renewal. So I don't mean to put you on the spot theologically, yep. but you said something just now that I, I want you to clarify. Mm-hmm. So not only is she our mother, she's your spouse, mm-hmm. but she's not my spouse. Well, I don't know. I mean, she's, I mean, in a particular way, she just said in a particular way for priests. Okay. But again, as in the same way with a particular way. For like nuns or spouses of Christ, and they wear like Jesus a wedding band. Is their spouse, you know. Yeah. Whereas, like, um, is she is Jesus the spouse of married women the same way to nuns? I'd say no. Because True, I, and, and yeah, this so. is not me trying to trip you up. No, no, I, no I, yeah. but, but I didn't know that about Our Lady and the relationship with with well, it's the still, priesthood. It's still, it's it's been developed by many different uh, saints and holy people, but it's still, it's. I think it's a spirituality. It's okay. It's it's been it's, it's been there. It's not, it may not be doctrine, but it's a spiritual practice that's helpful yeah. to priests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's um, it's it's kind of coming into its fore right now. I think in a particular time because priests need, you know. <laughs> yeah, we we need help. Yeah, and, and I don't so, mean, and it's and it's, a, and it's a beautiful <clears throat> way that um, that's why Saint Joseph was there, mm. and so um, you know, as a patron and you know, protector of the church, and uh, and priests, you know, emulate him in a particular way as well, um, and his chaste loving of Our Lady, you know. So even so, in the in the way that Saint Joseph was the spouse of Mary, but in a chaste way, you know. So it's a chaste love of Our Lady and the. And the nuns are chaste love of, of Jesus, but but the, the spousal like intimacy in that in that bond, you know, and so that Mary was there, you know, protecting or like really interceding for and loving and Saint Joseph in his role, and and so that she really wants to be that, so not just as a mother figure, but also just as the feminine, you know, as the mm-hmm. spouse, like mm-hmm. as a support. You know, mm-hmm. and we need that counterbalance as men, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and, no, exactly. but particularly in the priesthood. Yeah, and yeah. you know, every man, you know, in, in some way needs a woman in his life, and Mary wants to be that in a particular way for her mm-hmm. priests. And so that's why Saint Joseph was there with the beloved. Mm-hmm. So the she was mother to, to the beloved disciple John, but she was spouse, you mm-hmm. know, to Joseph, and they were both there with her. So that it would be this this place of priestly renewal. And I remember reading that, thinking like, "Wow, that sounds awesome! I wish somebody was doing something about that." And of course, that's when you get like the Holy Spirit going, yeah, yeah. And Jesus was like, yeah, me too. Yeah, I wish, I wish somebody <laughs> was doing something. You know? And I'm like, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, all right, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we got a lot. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know? I was like, fine. Um, I was like, we'll give it a go, anyways. So, and because we have such a love for the priesthood, and I know again how 
difficult it can be for our diocesan brothers. We just wanted to just do something, and it's just started starting small. But I think it's going to be something that will. I had, you know, call it a vision, whatever, of Knock being this place where there'll be priests from all over the world coming there because it will become known as a place of priestly renewal. Praise God. Um, and I just saw like all different types of habits and shapes and sizes and colors from all over the world. And, um, but it's only going to start if people, and so other, other people have started doing other things there as well. So it's the spirit is moving to some other, um, and so we just wanted to do our part and just to really offer a day of just, uh, prayer fellowship for priests to be together, just to really love on them, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and just to support them and just have a place where they can have this fellowship and prayer and, and receive some formation and yeah, um, just to serve our brother priests. Um, so that's what it's about. We have, um, one coming up, um, and I'm drawing a blank on the date right now. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so today is Friday. Right. When is it on in relation to today? Today is the 8th of November. It's on next Sunday. Whatever. Okay. Whatever so the, not the 11th, uh, the 10th of November, <laughs> but the 17th of November. That's the one. Yeah. 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 Okay. So 17th of November, yeah. get your parish priest there yeah. or your curate there. Yeah. So it starts Sunday night and then... um. Then the priests just find their own accommodation uh, wherever they, they particularly want to stay, and then it goes till Monday. Monday is usually the day off. So. Yeah, yeah. And um, so yeah, it's like about a twenty-four hour period, um, and we have you know mass, adoration, confessions. We have prayer teams praying with people with the priests there as well. Just some different. Um, so yeah, it's a and it's just. But honestly, it's just I felt like the Lord was like, just bring you know my sons here, mm-hmm. and I'll renew their hearts. You know, mm-hmm. it's not your job to do that, but to put something in place and so yeah yeah there's an event bright link for it um it's uh, probably under cfr franciscan fires of the renewal we'll, 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 we'll put, put a link, link in, yeah. yeah just uh but yeah just uh and that's one of the ways we just wanted to serve our priests and as, and as lay people i think um how can they you know support their priests i'd say first and foremost obviously prayer but on a on a practical level and not just going to them when you have questions or when you need something, but just supporting them, even just something as simple as honestly just going like, Hey father, you know, how you doing? You know, what's, you know, how you doing? What's going on in, in your life these days? You know, how thing because they're almost always like have the ministry cap on. That's mm-hmm. why people come to them. Mm-hmm. People want them to do ministry. Um, but like, who asked them how they're getting? Yeah, on. yeah, you know, yeah. and just you know, or just even invite them over for a meal with the family, you know. Um, and don't put them on a pedestal. Yeah, no, even exactly. though they should be on a pedestal, <laughs> yeah. don't put them on a pedestal. Yeah, no, yeah just be yourself. Don't, yeah, don't be awkward. Don't be weird. You know, yeah. like just, just hey, Father, like, will you bless this picture? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, <laughs> hey, Father, will you bless this water? <laughs> yeah. No, but just to be like, yeah, this is a place where they could actually relax and just um, um, because they are be, um, be off. They're yeah, they're being beat up by the world. Um, and so just, you know, just to know that, you know, they're not alone and that you appreciate them. I was just, um, on the way back from Greece, we stopped in Malta and, uh, it's part of the St. Paul, uh, pilgrimage. And, um, it was really beautiful. There was this old priest, he was in his nineties and, um, and, uh, and there's the sacristans there, the church, there's a group of men who every single day, you know, when his mass, he does, you know, the couple of masses a day, they, they have they they walk him out to the altar wow. into his chair holding his arm. They walk him up to the altar. They turn the pages for him. They point to where it should be in the book because he's so old. He gets confused. You know, they 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 basically walk him through the whole entire mass mm-hmm. every day. And I just thanked them afterwards. I was like, that's just a like gift of service that you're giving up your every every day you're here for him mm-hmm. so that he can say mass. And and it was really beautiful. They said, well, yeah, but we get mass and. Without him, we wouldn't have mass, and so we're just so grateful that he's still able to say mass for us here. And I was just like, "That's just really beautiful." But it's a little, I mean, little things like that. Like, there's a priest who needs help, mm-hmm. so they're helping him. You yeah. know, <laughs> you know, because if some people be like giving out, oh, geez, father's mass. You know, he's so old, he gets he loses his place, and he and he I can't. And he's hear, boring. He's boring. I can't <laughs> hear him. You know, like they're like, no, we get mass every day, and so Amen. and then they just and every day they 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 serve him, mm-hmm. and then it lets him serve everyone else you know mm-hmm. and so yeah just um yeah priests you know uh, they need friends they need people to talk to at times you know uh you know and um yeah but honestly just a simple question I mean, even if 
people even just ask themselves, when's the last time I just, you know, and don't try and fix them. Don't, you know, <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to let people talk, you know, and just, um, and honestly, if you ask some priest, you might find out, wow, he's doing really terrible. <laughs> you know, he's really struggling what you, right what, now. What do you do if a priest is doing really <laughs> terrible? Um, honestly, one of the best things, I mean, at that point is it's not your job to fix them, but just to pray for them. Mm. But just listen let, to him. Listen, honestly, yeah. listen, because we can fall into like, if you start going like, oh, no, you shouldn't be saying that or you shouldn't do that. And, okay, now they're just going to shut up, you know. Mm. Just let them talk, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, you know, you have to be in a place where you're in solid in your faith, you know. Um, but just, uh, okay, you know, yeah, like uh, then just, uh, that sounds really tough, you know, Father, I'm going to really pray for that. And then mean it and do and it. And can we pray you know, now, Father? Yeah. Would you ever, would, should should, yeah. should yeah. we do that? Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're comfortable with that, yeah. Yeah, yeah to say, yeah, I, I do it all the time when I'm mm-hmm. talking to somebody and they say, and, that's almost almost always do that is can we say a prayer right now mm-hmm. you know and just say Lord, you know just call down the holy spirit like lord just bless you know your your son here who's you know configured to you in a unique and special way and who brings us you know the body and the blood of jesus you know just ask for your just your healing and your protection and your grace upon him like yeah absolutely just pray for him <laughs> pray for him right there and then and then go home and continue to pray for them. And and the prayers work, you know. A number of people, and I have some, I have so many good friends here. And I just had a, a friend here who she just let me know she's got, you know, uh, the dates where she's getting ten masses offered for me in a row. Wow. Um, because she's a friend and she loves me, and she yeah. and she knows that I need prayer, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. And so she's getting mm-hmm. masses said for me, you know. Wow. Praise yes. God. Yeah. What so, a friend. Yeah, you know. And so it's things like that, you know, um, that we, you know, um. To know that the priests, you know, need, and then the number of people that will do that for me on a regular basis, you know, let me know they're praying for me and so you know, getting masses said for me. If you want to know how to love Father Joseph Mary, get masses said <laughs> yeah. for him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so good, Father Joseph Mary. We probably should finish up, but should I? Can I ask you to give us? First of all, we, Sheena normally says, "Okay, what's the Lord doing in your life?" We just shared that, so we're not mm. going to do that. Okay. And I, I, I must say, I miss her, but. What I would ask you to do is, would you mind giving me your priestly best and Mike who's here helping on the desk mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and anybody who listens to this podcast, mm-hmm. let's just do that, please. Yeah, sure. Sure. Let's pray. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, for anyone who's tuning in and um, especially if there's um, some people who just happen to randomly have somehow <laughs> stumbled upon this in any way, shape or form um, and don't even know how they got sucked into this or hearing this um for those who are you know people who are anyone who's struggling with anything right now any confusion or doubt any despair or sadness um just lord you you have all the answers you are the answer because you are the way the truth and life and i just ask your blessings upon uh, you and mike in the ministry here and just for the lord's blessings upon the ministry and just for the Lord's continued protection and blessing uh, to keep it just Lord again with this place between uh, this ministry and the enemies of God the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that you would surround them with your crown of thorns as a protection that you'd seal them in your blood Lord Jesus Mother Mary wrap them in your mantle of protection Saint Joseph in your cloak um, and for everyone who's listening that, that that you would do this for all of them Lord that you would protect your sons and daughters that you'd set ahead your protection of your angels around them and just that in all things that we would be protected, Lord. Um, because we can't do it uh, of ourselves. We can do nothing apart from you, Lord. But with you, all things are possible. And we just ask for, especially anybody who's uh, trapped in any darkness, any despair, any sadness, for, for your light to come in right now. May your joy just be upon them, Lord Jesus. May your joy and your peace I say, may the peace of the Lord be with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you. May the joy of the Lord be with you. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. I say, come, Holy Spirit, come with your grace. Come with your peace. Come with your blessings. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on them. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on them. Holy Spirit, come rest upon them, and may they rest in you. And may the Lord's joy and peace be with you, your home, your family, uh, this ministry. May of all of our listeners... May the Lord watch over, guide, guard, and protect you. May may you, your home, your families, your possessions, your, your employment, your job be protected and un- under the Lord's anointing. And may 
God's joy and strength be with you. May he, he be having, may you be given great discernment to know his will and the gift of contemplative prayer to hear his voice and the gift of encounter, intimacy with the Lord. May you feel his presence and hear his voice. May you know the Lord more deeply in your life. In the intercession of St. Francis and all the angels and saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Joseph Mary, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, That's thanks. a real privilege. Thanks. It was great to be here with you. God bless you. God bless you too. Let's get something to eat. Amen. <laughs>